Well, welcome everybody. Um, a lot of people are gonna be hopping on here tonight. I see the numbers going up quickly. Um, so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Uh, I'm still at work, obviously, uh, having had a long day and uh, hence the hair's a mess, you know, like just, it is what it is being a dentist, right? So somebody was interested in veneers. So we said, okay, fine, let's do a veneer program. <laughs> now you can imagine in an hour and 40 minutes or 45 minutes, whatever I was given, there was no way I could cover six to eight hours. I mean, we, I could go over stuff for days on this. There's a lot to understand. So knowing that, realize there's gonna be things I'm gonna have to skip over. So if you're asking me questions, I can stop and talk about certain things for a little while, or maybe it's gonna be coming up in part of the presentation. And so I'm gonna maybe skip the question or at the end, we're gonna try and set aside like 15, 20 minutes, et cetera, at the end to go over some of your questions. So as far as me, yeah, I'm a dentist just like the rest of you. And I do a lot of cosmetic dentistry. And, uh, you know, I, I've taken a bunch of CE just like you, right? So we don't really need to go into what I've done, but I, I've done a lot of things in my career and I run a number of different businesses and my business is solely cosmetic dentistry. Uh, so with that, running a business is very important, but doing procedures is important as well. I think most of the time we tend to concentrate more on the procedures and a little less on the business. And I think that should be reversed. But um, just realize I'm no different than you, but I do approach my business and my dentistry a little differently that anyone can do the same as, as I. Uh, so keep that in mind. So think for a minute. Think for a minute about yourself. How many veneers have you done? What problems did you have? What questions still come to mind? Make sure you get those answered tonight. And then think about your patient. What does your patient want? Do they know what they want? Do you allow them to interact with you and explain what they want? And if they don't know what they want, do you help them to understand what is possible and to be able to perceive things? Perceive things meaning see something and let them decide, yes, I like it or no, I don't. Whether it's seeing it in a photograph, seeing it on a digital mock-up, seeing it on their person. There's a lot of different ways we can show people possibilities. Doesn't mean we can duplicate exactly what we show them, but allows us to get inside their mind for a moment to see what it is they're wanting. And if we can't find something they want, it begs the question of, do we need to start working on them? Or should we spend a little more time asking questions? Again, what do you want? What does your patient want? How are you gonna figure that out? I can tell you how to prep a tooth. I can tell you how to take an impression, make a provisional and glue a piece of ceramic onto a tooth. It's really not that tough. It's really figuring out what the patient wants and get in to understand what they're gonna get. And then from there, it's the business of how do you attract them and how do you convert them to move forward? How do you get them financing? These are many aspects of dentistry that we don't typically talk about. We always focus on taking more classes on how to do procedures. So I won't get into those things, but I want you to recognize those are important. So for me, the number one solution is asking a question. And that question is, what does the patient want? What are they seeking? You know, Figure that out and you'll find success. So speaking of that, let's look at this first case. These are quote unquote veneers. Just like crowns and fillings, there's great ones and there's bad ones. So these are some veneers. The reason it's in black and white is I wanted you to perceive not only the value of these restorations, but also it's a little easier to perceive some of the, the differences between them and the natural teeth. So the question is, did this patient want this type of coloring? Were they given an opportunity to talk about the color? Were they able to look at the color before they were glued on? Or were they just given something? You know, it's like delivering a crown on the back of the mouth. You know, we don't usually ask someone like if they like the appearance of it. We just glue it in if it looks pretty close, right? In the front of the mouth, it's a little different for many of us. So not only are they a, a different type of color, but they're also a maybe a less than desirable shape for some of us. Okay? A little bulky, a little flat, uh, kind of an interesting texture, like kind of like eggshell wall paint. And so this patient came to me saying, hey, look, I don't like these. Uh, no one gave me the opportunity to talk about the color I wanted. Nobody allowed me to see them before they were glued on. I just, I got this and walked out the door. And so my question is, well, again, what do you want? He says, well, I actually just want my old teeth back. I, I, I don't mind the color of my old teeth. I just had some chips and things. I said, okay, so if I can give you the same colors with all these little discolorations and white hypocalcifications, all these things, you, you want that? 
I said, pointing to those, those lower teeth. I'm like, look at these. You want all this? And he's like, yeah. I said, no problem. Here you go. So here's his veneers. Now I show this to other patients. They'll say, oh my gosh, those are yellow. I don't want that. And what's all this texture and translucency? I don't want any of that. Everyone's different. And yet oftentimes I see certain laboratories and certain offices that kind of do this consistent type of appearance. And that's fine if that's what the patient wants. But I think you'll find, or at least I find, uh, patients are quite varied in what they want. And so being successful in my mind is allowing the patient to be happy and allow them to see things and explain things. And in doing so, I find we get better results as far as the happiness of the client. So again, someone that's unhappy to change their world and give them something that's, let's say, less bulky and more aesthetically appealing is something we can do. And it all boils down to taking a little extra time to talk to them about what they want. You know, how much texture, how much translucency? Well, how do you define that? You can't, you have to show pictures. And I don't care if it's my pictures or someone else's on Instagram or wherever you wanna find them, but you need photos. It doesn't have to be your work, it can be anybody's work. It can be models, uh, you know, that are celebrities. Uh, you know, anything's possible. Just, we need information to share so we can all see the same thing in front of us to decide if we like it. Because at the end of the day, you're not selling veneers. You're not selling cosmetic dentistry. You're not selling a new smile. You're selling them what comes from that. You're selling them some type of emotion. They want to change for a reason. What is that change going to do to them? That's what you're selling. Okay, so if you get them involved emotionally, you can sell them just about anything you, you know, that you want or they want. But at the end of the day, you have to meet their needs as far as the emotional outcome. So if you don't know theirs, you may have a problem on the delivery day that they're either very unhappy or just indifferent or extremely satisfied in telling the world. I would say this is probably the most important thing to think about. But nonetheless, we'll go into the procedures. So the first thing I would tell you as far as procedures, got to have some models. I can't tell you how many times I have seen patients that come into me where there was no workup. It was just, yeah, we can do veneers and they just start cutting the teeth the same day. Patient has no idea what's going on, where they're going, how much tooth is being reduced, nothing. And that usually, at least when I see them, is a problem. But I guess I'm, I'm usually seeing them because there is a problem. So I, for many people, it may work fine. But the ones I'm always seeing, it's a problem because they had no idea how much tooth was gonna be destroyed or removed. They had no idea what was involved and they're unhappy. And so I've got to calm them down and get them to go back and say, no, no, it's okay. Here's what's going on. You know, so take that as a, as a piece of information that really to set yourself apart, take a little bit of time, get those diagnostic models and records, figure out where you're going so you have a happy person. Okay? So how do I do models? Well, we've all taken impressions. Get your favorite impression tray, grab some type of impression material, and capture a great impression that captures all the margins and gingiva and everything else. I will tell you what I use is I use these heat wave thermoplastic trays from Clinician's Choice. I use these because in one minute's time in a hot water bath, they instantly become pliable. I can put it in just about anyone's mouth. And granted, they have four sizes, but it becomes pliable. So it can adapt very easily. And I use these for my final impressions as well. You'll see them again later. But um, I take typically some type of duplicating polyvinyl material. So like silgenot from Kettenbach is a phenomenal material. It's like an alginate, right? But it's a PVS. You could also use other companies like Clinician's Choice. Uh, you know, they have their county counterfeit, uh, which works great as well. I have that too. Uh, DMG uh, makes theirs also. Um, I think it's called Status Blue, as I recall. So a lot of different companies make these. Kerr has one as well. So a lot of them out there. So these are my favorites that I use most of the time. But obviously in my position, I get to try lots of different materials to see which ones I like, you know, the handling in my hands. So the reason I use these as opposed to alginates. With alginates, I'm going to have to take six impressions, three uppers and three lowers to change the teeth. That means a lot of time and effort and a lot of extra materials. Okay. And they dehydrate and change over time. So you have to pour them up quickly and then you're done with them. With these, I can pour up a couple models and I can set them aside and leave them and I can pour up more models, whether it's a week from now or a month from now. So I like these for that purpose, okay? 
So it looks like an alginate, but it's a polyvinyl material. So again, this is the silgenate from Kettenbach. And so, as I mentioned, I have three models. Now, why do I have three? I'll tell you why. Practice, practice, practice. And so I can practice. I wanna know what I'm doing before I get to the patient's mouth, but I also wanna show them what's possible before we get to the mouth. And if I make a mistake, I've got more models to play with. But at the same time, it comes a legal document showing where we started. It also is the ability to give something to the laboratory showing what I'm envisioning of doing as far as how I prepared the models instead of allowing them to prepare the models where they may over prepare things. And now the wax up is not to where I want it to be. I want to show them what I want to do as far as preparation and then let them wax it up. I don't like it when they prep it because usually they just destroy a bunch of tooth really quickly. And now we have a problem because the communication is off between myself and the laboratory, the thickness of the veneer and where the veneer is going to go. Now, if I need a, a bleach model, I've got spare models for doing bleaching as well. And obviously I'll mount these up on articulator. I'll do all this myself. And as I said, prepping the teeth, if you're not gonna prep the teeth, you're missing out on learning what you're gonna be doing that day. So you're going in blind, but also you're not giving the laboratory information. So if you're not gonna prepare it, at least write on the models, like I have in this image saying, here's what I want you to do. Take three tenths here, take three tenths there, take a little gum away, narrow this tooth a little bit, give the laboratory as much information as possible because good information in gives you good product back. Now with an ideal wax up, it gives you all these templates, templates for you to make mock-ups and provisionals, but also templates for the laboratory to duplicate the wax up into final restorations as closely as we can. So this is important. Now from there, when the lab gets your case, if they've done all these things, they can take your wax up and all these guides and then you say, okay, now I have prepared teeth that have to fit back into this guide. And I know that we have the right amount of space because we had a lot of good communication based on the doctor prepping the models ahead of time. And then the lab waxing it to ideal, having the right thickness. And by having great communication, I know I've got the space so they can build in the desired final product. Okay. So very important there. So when we talk about preparations, there's a lot of different ways in which you can prepare teeth. And give me one second, I'm looking at questions. Great. How do I feel about taking digital impressions for veneer preps? Go for it. If you've got a new digital scanner and you like the way it uh, turns out and your lab likes using them with the model work and stuff, go right ahead, that'd be great. Uh, I've had two scanners. I personally don't use them for my veneers and my lab doesn't wanna use it either. So uh, it, it just depends on who you're working with and what you like, okay? Um, so thanks, that was a good one. All right, so preparation designs. It's simple. It's simple if you've practiced. If you're gonna go practice in the mouth for the first time, you're gonna end up taking more tooth structure away. Because you're gonna realize, oh, I should have done this. Let me take a little more. Oh, let me correct that. Let me do a little more. Just take an extra five minutes and go sit down in the laboratory and prep a model. There's no tongue, there's no lips, there's no anesthesia. You can butcher it if you want and take out another model, but go practice. You'll learn so much. It's amazing. So how much tooth structure do we take off? Well, every case is different. Every case is unique. And so this diagram saying, hey, if we're having less change, less color change, less change of the two structure, all of those things, well, they require less preparation, maybe no preparation. But if we have to have a lot of rotational changes and, and uh, we have cracked or damaged teeth or a bunch of fillings in a tooth, well, now we're having to do a lot of change and that's gonna require more reduction and more extension, let's say. And for some of those cases, we're better off just doing a crown. So that's something to think about as well. And that's where you figure it out ahead of time on a model. So let's take a look at preparation design for a moment. We'll get more into how and when we use each preparation design, but let's look at the basic fundamentals for a minute. If we're doing just a traditional veneer, and so I would say we have basically three different incisal edge changes that we can do. If you have someone that has a beautiful front tooth as far as its length, and you just wanna change the color and put something on the front of the tooth, then a preparation design that I have here called A is what I would use. These are from Harry Albers. And style A basically is we're not taking any of the incisal edge away. There's no reason to remove it 
because it's intact and healthy. Okay, so don't make more work for yourself. Now, if we have some slight chipping or roughness on the chewing edge, and we just need the edge to look a little better, but we're not really lengthening it much, you know, just like half a millimeter or, or less kind of thing, really small, then I would go to a B approach. You'll notice on B, we've gone from the facial to the incisal, and we've left the line angle on the lingual incisal. So we have this kind of rounded from the facial to the incisal. So we have a nice surface in which to seat the veneer where we're changing the incisal edge for you know, the beauty appearance of it, but we're not really lengthening it. But if we have a case where we're lengthening it, now we have the C approach. And I would say there's almost like a C1 or C2, depending on how you like to prep. And I should probably add another image here. So C1, which is the C you're seeing in front of you, is if you wrap over the incisal edge slightly. Okay, so by doing so, I have a actual line angle that is on the lingual aspect, slightly higher from the incisal edge. Now, why do I do this? Well, you're wrapping over for strength. You have more material, bulk for strength, but that slight retention by wrapping over gives me a little bit of more longevity potentially where I'm not stressing the glue, the adhesion. I have some mechanical retention. Now, there's been studies that came out that say you don't need to wrap over. You can just go straight back you know, at a 90 degree and just kind of a flat table and slightly round the uh, facial line angle. So you have kind of like just a flat table. You can do that as well, research has shown. My only thought with that is you're now relying solely on adhesion to hold things together and to keep your temporaries on. So me personally, I like to do a slight wrap around onto the lingual, okay? Next question in here says, do all preparation styles, A, B, and C, break the proximal contact? Fabulous question. So uh, they don't. I'm just getting that question out of my face here. Uh, the only time I break the contact, A, is when I have found out on the model work it needs to be done. But here's why I typically would do it. If you have an existing diastema, you're gonna extend through the, the contact, even though it's broken, but you're gonna extend through to create the preparation design to have a line of draw. If you have a large black triangle or teeth are kind of angled, leaning measly towards each other where the roots are flared out, you're gonna probably, and you'll find it on the model work, you'll probably extend in a proximal to be able to close the black triangle to actually get a papilla to grow back into that triangle. Uh, the other times, if I have rotation where I'm trying to unrotate a tooth, you're typically gonna break contacts. If I have a large existing restoration, I usually will carry my veneer through the old restoration and onto healthy tooth structure. Most of the time I'll take out the old restoration and also replace it, okay? So those are the times typically that I am going through the contacts. Now, the other times I would say is if you have someone that has gross discoloration, extensive damage and rotation, you're doing a lot of stuff and a lot of heavy reduction, then you're most likely going to go in proximal. I know as dentists, we like to have this cookbook recipe that we do everything the same. And I'm not pointing out to the question maker here. I'm just saying in general, from all the years of teaching, we as dentists like to be very dogmatic in our approach. And so I'll tell you, there isn't one for veneers. It's not like a crown prep where it's just simple, go around the tooth, reduce you know, eight tenths to two millimeters based on material choice. Keep your taper at six to eight degrees and have an axial wall longer than four millimeters. It's not that simple. And that's why I said practicing will give you all the benefit in the world to realize when you probably should extend through an approximately and when you shouldn't. Okay, a fabulous question there, thanks. All right, so looking at these models from the side, you'll see the A, B, and C, starting from left to right, we've got A, B, and C. You'll notice that all three of these, if we didn't break the contact, the contact would be right here where that red dot is. So we're not breaking the contact, but we're gonna do a little bit of a dog leg, we call it. So we're gonna extend a little bit into the gingival area in approximately, but we're not gonna break the contact. So this red dot's representing the contact of the adjacent tooth. Again, we talked about when I would break a contact, but if we're not breaking a contact, I still wanna have that margin not be perceivable. So I'm gonna extend it a little bit, not through the contact, but the part between the contact and the gingiva, I'm gonna extend back just a little bit so that my margin is hidden kind of in between the teeth, OK? 
Okay. Now, if I have to extend through the contact, you'll see here's um, another one of the C1 incisal preparation designs, but we've extended through the contact. So the red dot is now where the contact would have been, let's say. So you can see we've extended all the way through the contact and moved to the lingual, such that when you place ceramic on this tooth, it doesn't look like it has just wings going laterally off the tooth, which I have seen out there. It actually looks like a tooth that naturally emerges and has a little fuller figure, so to speak, to create the contact. So you always wanna extend through the contact so you have a natural emergence angle and not some bulbous, just immediate porcelain jutting out to the side, okay? So if I rotate this, you can tend to see the A, B, and C styles, as well as the interproximals. And again, these come from Harry Albers. This is what we used when I was teaching a graduate program at UCLA. All right. So this is a diagram out of Dr. Bruce Crispin's textbook, the one we used at UCLA. So I have to give him credit for his book and for his imagery here. But nonetheless, you know, when we think of a dogmatic approach, we think of two teeth, if they're in a good position orthodontically, that really what we're trying to do is take a little bit off a tooth to create space to put something back on so that it doesn't look bulky and awkward, kind of like artificial nails sometimes. You know, they're bulky and weird looking. Uh, when they're done really well and thin, they look pleasing. So we used to think like, okay, we're gonna take off about half a millimeter of tooth structure and still be in enamel and make a half a millimeter thick porcelain veneer, typically feldspathic porcelain back in the 80s and 90s, right? And so you, looking at a preparation design, it would look something like this. We didn't break the contacts. We were just changing the surface of the tooth to create space. And space, you can see, slightly interproximal without breaking the contact so that teeth can have a normal profile. When you see veneers that look like they're swedged together like piano keys, it's because they didn't create enough space in between teeth in the facial embrasure, again, without breaking the contact. And so they get these square, funny looking teeth. So if we make space, we can glue porcelain on. Hang on, I saw another question pop up. Uh, how, do they, how do you know the amount of tooth you wanna remove before the wax up is complete? I'll get to that in a moment, but good question. I got to click buttons to get the questions out of my out of my way. So hang on a second. There we go. All right. So again, we see kind of a dogmatic approach like this in diagrams saying, hey, for feldspathic porcelain, we need to take off two tenths to eight tenths of a millimeter on the facial and a millimeter, a millimeter and a half off the incisal. I would say this is wrong. Wrong for a number of reasons. And we're going to touch on it. You can do this. But in my mind, you're potentially taking too much tooth structure away and not everyone has their tooth in the same place. And that's where, again, figuring out ahead of time on models is important. And so we're gonna to get to that. If you're doing press ceramics, you say, hey, I don't do feldspathic, I do press. Makes no difference. The press, they may tell you to take a little more tooth structure away, but again, you don't have to. Depends on where the tooth is. It depends on the final appearance you're going for. And it depends on how skilled your laboratory ceramist is. So again, I wouldn't go by these either. But again, it's, it's meant to try and make it simplified for you. But in my mind, it could be making it more challenging or taking more tooth structure away. So here's how I think of it. If this is a case that I have models and I'm, I've already looked at the patient, I've taken photographs of the patient to determine are teeth sticking out too far facially? Are teeth set back lingually? Do I wanna have a broader smile, a narrower smile? What am I trying to achieve? Not just me, but what do they want? Based on what they want, I can help them do various things. If we wanna widen a smile, it helps us out. By widening a smile, we have to take less tooth structure off. We're gonna actually expand the smile by making ceramics stick out further. So we have maybe thicker ceramics and less adjustment. If someone's tooth is sticking out too far, well, now we're gonna to have to take more tooth structure off to make it look like it's moved back orthodontically to the lingual. So when I look down on a model like this, after having seen the patient and had discussions with them, I start to devise in my mind where I want to go. And so you can see by these lines, if I'm trying to widen someone's smile, I have a lot of area in which to widen, but I have some rotations. I have teeth that are set back lingually. Um, and I have a couple of teeth that are maybe facial. And so my question is the ones that are positioned facially, can I make them out facially further or are those now my limitations? And so looking at their smile and determining where you wanna go with their guidance, 
you can start to determine where we're going to make this smile end up. And based on this little blue line I just put in, you can see now the one that's out the furthest is tooth number eight. And so by being out the furthest, can I make it go out farther? Or does that tooth have to actually come back lingually, meaning I'm going to take more tooth structure off? You have to decide this and every case is different, hence practicing. Now, if it's out too far, but I like number nine, let's say, then all I need to do is prepare number eight back to where number nine is. And once it's symmetric to number nine, the question then gets posed again. Do I need to take more off of both eight and nine? Or can I now make eight and nine go back out facially? And you say, well, how far facially at this point? Again, color change. Am I gonna do a significant color change? Do I need to mask out bad colors that are inherent inside the tooth? Or can I use something very thin and let some of the existing colors come through? Or do I use a more of an opacious ceramic that blocks everything because the patient wants a Hollywood white smile? These are things that you consider in the materials and the appearance they want and how you're gonna prepare the teeth. So you can see in walking through this, you can start to figure out where you need to take a little tooth structure off to make a tooth look like it's rotated or bring a tooth lingually or facially. Once you've kind of harmonized where the teeth position are by taking away excess amounts, like I was just talking about, taking the excess off of number eight, once you've taken excess off and you now go, okay, now that I've got the excess off, now from here, can I wax things out facially and be happy with it? Or do I need to start taking off a couple tenths of a millimeter? <coughs> Excuse me. So for your ceramic, you're typically gonna want four tenths of a millimeter for most materials. Okay, you can press things down to three tenths of a millimeter. You know, you can actually make uh, feldspathic portions, depending on how skilled you are, you know, two tenths, three tenths of a millimeter, pretty thin, but they're very fragile. So again, depends on where you're trying to end up is gonna determine how you're preparing these teeth. But the first thing is take off the excess in a rotational case and then do your ideal reduction based on how much needs to come off. Now, do I always take off the same amount? No. If I feel I can now, if eight and nine are harmonious, if I can wax both teeth out half a millimeter, then I don't really have to touch the tooth at all, right? I've waxed it out half a millimeter. All I gotta do is put a nice finish line on the teeth so that it doesn't look like it's a press on nail. So it actually looks like it's believable. So just a little bit of reduction on a margin, maybe a couple tenths of a millimeter is all it takes. So let's look at some examples. We talk about minimal or no prep cases, and, and I, I've done those. If, to be done right, you have to have a pretty skilled technician or you have to have a tooth that's set back lingually to look you know, desirable. Uh, it, it makes it a little more challenging. I wouldn't try to do like a minimal no prep case on everybody, obviously. Specific cases will work, but it's not everybody. But I think for a lot of cases, you can do fairly minimal reduction because even if let's say you take off two tenths or three tenths of a millimeter on a tooth, that's tiny. You could also build a tooth out facially two tenths or three tenths and the patient might not perceive it. So at that point, if you've taken three tenths off the tooth and you've waxed things out facially three tenths as well, that's six tenths of a millimeter for porcelain. That's a lot of space, but you only took three tenths off the tooth. So it's always this give and take figuring out how far I can reduce the tooth and how far I can push the, the facial aspect out, those determine where I put my finish lines and how much tooth I take off. So again, every tooth is different. Every case is different. So for any of my cases, first thing we do is obviously take those models, do our preparation design, do our wax up. From there, I can duplicate the wax up. I can duplicate it with a Siltec putty technique. I duplicate it with a, a bead line technique. And I'll tell you what a bead line technique is in a moment but I can duplicate it in some capacity. I can then go to the patient's mouth. And this is again, for a minimal or no prep case. I can then go to the patient's mouth, fill these over impressions with acrylic and push it over their teeth and show them what's possible in the form of a mock-up on their person. So now they can see it and go, okay, hey, is three tenths of a millimeter thicker on your tooth or half a millimeter thicker on your tooth? Is that gonna bother you? Most people will say, no. So it looks great. Perfect, that means we're saving tooth structure, less reduction. And this is why it's so important to practice and do the wax up. And for some cases, do these um, mock-ups in the mouth. So again, asking the patient, are you happy with the thickness? Are you happy with the appearance? You can then make actual depth cuts through the acrylic on someone's teeth. And by doing depth cuts, knowing how thick you want your ceramic, you may not even touch the tooth. 
because the acrylic on the front of the tooth may be thick enough. Let's say if it's six tenths of a millimeter and you're only prepping five tenths, you won't touch the tooth. <coughs> but for the same token, if the acrylic's only two tenths on the front of a tooth and you want five tenths of a millimeter of reduction for a, a room for a veneer, well, now you're gonna end up cutting into the tooth three tenths of a millimeter, still pretty small, okay? Now for these minimal or no prep cases, they typically don't need provisionals because you haven't really changed anything. Now it's nice to put provisionals on them so they can see what it's gonna look like and start to get excited. But back in the eighties and nineties, we didn't even put provisionals on people. You know, because we were doing minimal reduction. They didn't have sensitivity because we we're still in enamel. Then when pressables came out, we started grinding off substantial amounts of tooth structure. And we've seen through research, the longevity on those types of veneers aren't as good as traditional veneers when you're basing them primarily on enamel. So keep that in mind also for longevity for your patient. Be careful you don't have undercuts, especially when you're doing like the C style or extending in approximately, you gotta make sure that line of draw is gonna work on delivery day. So that's the only other thing to be careful of. Okay, based on color changes, you're obviously gonna to wanna to use different materials, different reduction. And so that's a whole discussion itself, but obviously something more opaque is gonna mask out colors. And if it's something very opaque, you can do less reduction. If you're trying to build in all kinds of translucency and crazy colors, you're gonna to have to take more tooth structure off to be able to build in those layers, okay? So recognize based on where you're wanting to end up is gonna determine how much tooth you're taking off. And that's gonna go into your model preparation design. You're practicing. I throw this slide in only because we have what I would say is four different materials in which to create veneers out of. And so some are stronger than others, others are weaker. All of them can have great physical properties once laminated to the tooth structure. And they can also have you know, great aesthetics based on who's implementing them and how good their skill is. Um, if you have someone that's you know, like a heavy grinder and they've worn off like three millimeters off the incisal edge, probably not gonna go with feldspathic porcelain unless we're changing their bite function or um, you know, kind of doing a full mouth rehabilitation where we've changed kind of the whole schematics of things. That probably be the only time I would use that for a case where I'm trying to rebuild lost function. Obviously if someone's missing function because they've destroyed things, we're typically gonna wanna have more strength. And so jumping into the lithium disilicate type of materials or even into potentially some of the modern uh, translucent and multi-layered zirconias. I point these out because we don't have time to go into material properties so much, but recognize you have different materials with different strength properties that really only come into play when you're starting to lengthen a tooth. If you're just putting glass on the front of the tooth, it doesn't really matter to some extent because once the glass is laminated onto the front, it's the same as glass on a countertop. It doesn't really have the ability to be broken unless a traumatic accident occurs. It's really the only time you need that strength is when you're lengthening a tooth. And so if you're lengthening a tooth based on their function, you probably want to gravitate towards something that's stronger. And at the same time, you probably want to get them to invest in an insurance plan, meaning an occlusal guard, right? So one of the materials I like to use when we're talking about lithium disilicates, and I know everyone likes to talk about one particular brand out there, but uh, I kind of like GC America's product personally. And so the lithium disilicate product that they have, the Lisi Press and the Lisi Veneering Ceramic is the materials that my ceramists use that I think are phenomenal. And granted, he's a great ceramist. He can make everything look good. But I think the colors on these are amazing. So if you've been using Emacs or Impress and things all these years, that's great. Keep using them. But this is a different lithium disilicate than many of the, you know, the impress materials that we've all seen and have great results out of. Just another product out there. So it's just like another pair of denim jeans, right? Uh, just a slight different twist that I think has some phenomenal color properties. Uh, so I throw this out because people usually ask, what do I use? It's not always what you use, it's whose hands are using the product too. So nonetheless, some phenomenal things can be made. All right, so preparation design. I think we hit on it a fair amount, but we're gonna go a little deeper for a moment here. Here you can see the A, B, and C styles again. And so you can see that C style isn't really going over a lot. So it's not that you have to make some weird squared off edge and go way up the back of the tooth. It's just enough to give it a little mechanical resistance form and retention so that when a patient is functioning, you're not relying solely on glue. And let's face it, we know glue, you know, adhesive resins fatigue with time. And so I would rather not have something fatigue. I'd rather have it 
you know, be strengthened by the ceramic so it can have better longevity. Okay. So preparation reduction. A lot of different companies have reduction burrs out there, whether it's Brassler, Comet, Axis, you name it. Hey, if you use these, that's great. If you like the way they work, that's fabulous. I would tell you for me, I don't use any of these. Why? Because as you've seen, I'm very particular on how much tooth I remove and on what part of the tooth I remove it. These tend to be very dogmatic in their approach. And you'll see on the far left where it says, hey, at the gum line, you only want three tenths or four tenths of a millimeter. At the middle third, you want eight tenths to a millimeter. At the incisal third, you want 1.1 to 1.3. I would disagree. If that tooth is rotated facially, I'm going to take way more off at the facial and significantly less at the gum line. For the same token, if it's if the tooth is set back lingually, I don't have to take much of anything off. And so I, I feel like these are misleading, that it's almost like we're blindfolded and we can just use this. Um, so I tend to use something different. So what do I do? If I'm trying to take off tenths of a millimeter, I need a tool that gives me that capability. And so Lasco, probably a bird company you've never heard of, Lasco is out of uh, Los Angeles area. And uh, I was turned on to them back at UCLA and they make these phenomenal depth cutting burrs. It has a safe barrel, the safe barrel, and I'll point to it here. Safe barrel is this area right in here that it can't cut. It just rests on the tooth structure. So you have the shank come down to a safe barrel and then you have this diamond coated disc. So the disc can only go in until it bottoms out onto that smooth barrel. It usually leaves a black scuff mark on the tooth or the acrylic because uh, the carbide just leaves that black mark uh, when it scuffs something. So these, as you can see on the far right, go from two tenths of a millimeter all the way down to seven tenths and then jump to a millimeter. I can be very precise you know, uh, as far as how much tooth structure I'm gonna take off. And so doing that becomes very critical because if your lab thinks you're taking off seven tenths and you're taking off three tenths, you're going to be in trouble when it comes time to make a temporary and do final restorations. So there has to be better communication. So let's look at how these are used. You know, here we have a case. We're going to do our preparation design. So we have to make our depth cuts. Not really going to go into the A, B, and C style here, but think about your edge designs. You can see someone obviously got some wear in here. But I'm going to go in with this Lasco depth cutting burr. And when I make these depth cuts, I usually put three across the facial. And so as I put three across the facial, you'll start to see these little black scuff lines. That's because the barrel is resting on the tooth. Now it won't make a scuff mark everywhere, but it will make a scuff mark pretty well most of the tooth that you're touching, okay? But I'm not trying to like force this. You know, if I didn't get a, a scuff mark, that's okay. But I'm just trying to rub along gently on that tooth structure and cut up perfect depth and this, excuse me, allows me to do so. So then after I've made these depth cuts, and you can use this on the incisal edge too, but after I've made these depth cuts, I then connect these three planes. Do I use the same burr? No, I, I could potentially use two tenths of a reduction on the facial at the gum line. I could use a five tenths in the middle third, and I can maybe use a three tenths towards the incisal. Because all these burrs have different depths of uh, cutting ability, it gives me great variability. So just because I showed this purple one doesn't mean I use it across all the teeth. Because the teeth have different positional changes, I may vary that. So, oh, great question. The question is, so since all three preparation designs do not extend lingually, the occlusion would not matter as much. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And so you bring up a great point. Anytime I'm prepping teeth, I stay out of the occlusion right? As soon as you go into the occlusion, now you have problems. Don't wrap it around onto the lingual where you're going to be into removing a functional stop and their bite is altered or putting your margin in a place that it's going to get traumatized from, you know, occlusion. Try and keep your margins out of occlusion wherever possible. The only time you're really going to have any issues is functional movements being, you know, protrusive and lateral excursives or nocturnal bruxism, right? So yeah, by all means, keep it out of function wherever possible. And that's where if you have this on an articulator when you're practicing preparation designs, you can realize where you're gonna need to stop the day you go into the mouth. Because some people want to protrude, but their occlusion keeps them you know, into a, a bite position that doesn't allow them to do so. You take away that functional stop and all of a sudden they can move forward, the whole bite just changed, right? And now you got a whole can of worms you gotta deal with. Or if you recognize it ahead of time, Maybe you want to equilibrate them before you even start the veneer process. So again, it begs a question to be asked before you start working on someone. So again, if you connected these three planes together, you can see we have a preparation design. 
and we'll go into this more in a moment, but I wanted you to get the understanding of how do I, how do I think about where I'm going to put things so I can try and stay in enamel wherever possible? Because the goal is to stay out of the occlusion, to take the least two structure off, and to stay in enamel anytime I can. Okay? So let's look at an actual case, and we'll just walk through certain components of this case. Patient's main concerns, what do they want? They want their teeth longer so they don't see the tongue. They don't like the spaces at the incisal edge. They also don't care for the white marks on eight and nine that were there developmentally. So the question is, okay, so we're happy with everything about the color, the shape, the position. Yes, okay, gum line doesn't bother you? No, perfect. So all we're doing is changing the length. We're keeping the color the same. So in looking at this, I have to take very little amounts of two structure off, you know, just like three, four tenths of a millimeter. Why? Because I want the existing color to come through a quote unquote contact lens. So my veneer is gonna be fairly translucent. It's gonna be fairly thin to allow the colors to come through. Now, if these teeth are, let's say too far back lingually, well, then I can take even less tooth structure off because I can just make the, the porcelain go on the front of the tooth and bulk the tooth out a little bit, right? So functionally, this person has no canine guidance. They have group function until they finally make contact. So I'm actually going to take the canines and lengthen them, but I don't need to reduce anything for this particular case. Now, I would say if you want to put a very small finish line on there, please do so. It makes the, the ceramist job a little easier. It makes your job during cementation easier that you're not trying to finish a porcelain margin. But these are kind of unique because I call them contact lenses. And not only are they very thin, but we only put it on the mesial of the canines. So it's literally a half veneer. So both of our canines, because of the way they're rotated, we did half veneers and we lengthened the teeth using Feldspathic porcelain. All right, so here she is beforehand. Here we can see our close up. So we take our models. We decide where we want to end things so that we can't see the gum tissues. You, know, you can go into smile design, all kinds of stuff, but we're you know, measuring how long should a tooth be and trying to be in a norm so we don't have some funny looking teeth. And so recognizing how long a tooth needs to be, we make some marks on here, we wax it up. And so we've waxed up four front teeth and two half veneers, all right? And so from here, I can duplicate the wax up to make reduction guides. There are two different types of guides that I typically use. One is like this one here, where it's nothing more than a bleach tray with holes in it. And you can put as many holes as you want in it. You can see this one's got a lot based on where I wanna measure reduction. How difficult is the case gonna be? Another type, which I don't use, but you may see are these split thickness guides where you can put it on the facial. These tend to have some play in them. Not that the bleach guide doesn't, if you're careful with the bleach guide, you can get a pretty good result. But these I feel can float around the lower left. Uh, I feel those can float a little bit, so I don't use them, but I have tried them. But you can see here, based on how I hold it and when I pull it away, it may look like you have enough reduction and other times maybe too much. So as you use these types of guides, they can be a little misleading, I feel. But, uh, but if they work for you, that's great. They're just showing you possibilities, okay? So, Reduction using the bleach tray with holes in it is one of my favorites if I'm gonna be taking two structure off. But as I mentioned earlier, the other one of my favorites is actually putting acrylic on the person before I get started making depth cuts through the acrylic and or through their two structure. Uh, but I usually have that clear overlay to go back and check things. So those are the two things that I typically implement. So again, if we're trying to do reduction across the facials and then sizals, I can use these reduction guides, but I want you to see these again, the A, B, and C, because we're gonna utilize these in this case that we're looking at. So here's our case again. You'll notice the incisal edges are slightly skewed. And let's say the laterals, one's longer than the other. So you can see a few things there. The canines, we're gonna wrap over those without touching them, right? Because they're deficient. So here you can see my depth cuts, right? We utilize the Lasco depth cutting burr to make these depth cuts. You can see the little black scuff marks. I've got three planes or on the laterals, uh, you know, like um, 
you can see some tiny marks on one, maybe less on the other. It just depends on how hard you push and how it scuffs, but you don't have to see a scuff for it to do its job. Once you've done this, you connect the planes together and here's what the tooth starts to look like. It's not flat. It's got an actual uh, conformity of what a natural tooth would have. So it has three planes. So connecting all these together, we now have our facial reduction. Having done the facial reduction, and now I have to lengthen certain teeth, okay? So we go in here with our chamfer burrs to reduce the facials, but now we have to wrap over onto the incisals. So what you can see here is I did a B style on eight, nine, and 10, and I did a C style on seven. The reason I did the B style, you can see here, is all I was really doing was trying to make the chewing edges smooth. And I'm gonna lengthen them ever so slightly and or strength, or not strengthen, straighten them, okay? Now you'll see the other lateral was considerably shorter. And so being as considerably shorter, I didn't wanna just float ceramic off of it. I could, but I chose not to. So I, I did a slight wrap over on the lingual to make it a C style to give me some retention when they're under function. You'll notice again, Minimal reduction in tooth structure, minor changes to the incised ledges, we left the canines alone. If you have someone that shows the gum line and you're making a color change where you want the margins to be at the gum line or slightly higher, by packing a cord, you can get the gums to move up about a half a millimeter. Okay. Preparation design, I use chamfer burrs. I've got my own burr kits from Brassler. Um, just what I like to use, so I got them all in one place. Uh, but whatever company you like, have a few different types of chamfer birds, thinner ones and thicker ones based on how much reduction, based on where you're working, whether it's a lower anterior or an upper anterior, you know, you have to have different thicknesses to go in a proximal or get real close to breaking the contact, but without breaking the contact. So you need the right tools. So make sure you've got the right burrs to be able to do the job. Get your photographs. Photographs are important for the laboratory to know what things look like. Obviously, when teeth are dehydrated, they look different than when they're hydrated. So make sure as soon as possible to take a photograph before the teeth continue to get more dehydrated and try to keep the teeth as moist as possible throughout the procedure so that you get the most accurate color representation to give to your technician. From there, you take your impressions, the same as you would for a crown or anything else. So you got your photographs. If you want to scan, someone asked about scanning, go ahead and scan at this point. Uh, from there, you're going to make your provisionals. Uh, pr we'll get into provisionals in a moment, but nonetheless, these provisionals have no glue holding them on. And this is devised straight off of their wax up. Shouldn't take more than four or five minutes to put temporaries on. And so we'll go into that. But nonetheless, this is what she looks like when she gets done. Again, we'll go into cementation and other things. This was all about preparation and what I'm looking for. We can see her close up. So minimal reduction, feldspathic porcelain. We lengthen things a little bit. She has good occlusion now because we built in good function. She didn't wear her teeth down. They had been orthodontically repositioned. They lined the gum lines up. So now we need the teeth longer. Okay. And that's why I went using felds, that's why I use feldspathic porcelain to make this look the way it does. And that's why I also didn't reduce tooth structure uh, on the canines and minimal reduction on the uh, incisors. So I can put a very thin, beautiful piece of glass on here. My ceramist did a fabulous job. Here's the half veneers. And so when she goes into protrusive and excursive, she's got function where she didn't before. All right. So again, uh, GC has got some fabulous products. Um, the Lisi veneering ceramic is one we've been using for a while now, but if you use pressables, they have that too, and they both work together. So again, this was all about kind of the initial workup and reduction, giving you an, a quick overview of how this goes and what the patient wants and how we were gonna achieve it. And a lot of the little steps along the way, okay? So knowing that you can see how simplistic it could be in, a, in an easy case like this. And I'm just looking at questions to see if there's anything I need to look at here. Uh, here's a good question. Do I place cord before I prepare the margins? I place the cord based on where I want the margin to go. So if I'm going to put a margin right at the gum line and it's going to blend in as far as the color or translucency of the ceramic, then I don't need to bury something under the gum line. 
if their lip hides the gum line, then again, I don't need to bury something under the gum line. So keep your life simple. Don't retract the tissue and bury something under the gum line unless you have to, okay? As soon as you start putting stuff under the gum line, you've got periodontal issues, you've got potential bleeding, you've got hygiene issues long-term, cementation day is gonna be more difficult. So again, work with the patient to determine what they show, how much color change we're trying to achieve. Because if the gum recedes with time, just as it will by nature, just as we get older, do they have a white chiclet of a tooth that you then see a yellow you know, cementum or dentin down there? Or do they want something more translucent or has a gradual transitional change that when the gum does recede, doesn't look like anything ever was, was there. The margin is unperceivable, even though it was at the gum line. So if I have someone that shows gums and we're making a big color shift and I need to put it under the gum line, then yes, I will prep like 98% of the tooth, then pack my cord to move the tissue out of the way. And then I do my margin along the gum line last to drop that margin down just a little bit more. Uh, another question was, do I worry about marginal staining on the half veneers? No, if done properly, uh, they're great. It's just like putting um, you know, bonding on a front tooth. If it's done well and polished, uh, you don't get anything on the margins. But good question. All right, let me get out of this. We'll move along. So you're, again, you're selling emotion. Did you get that person what they wanted? Did you have enough discussion so they knew fairly well what they were getting? Okay, that's important. All right, next case, another minimal preparation case. You can see the person doesn't have a lot of um, tooth contact. They've got a lot of spaces. Uh, we have some smaller teeth. So instantly you can say, all right, we've got smaller teeth, we've got spaces. We can make these teeth potentially come out facially we have to take less tooth structure off. We also are gonna to have to now prepare interproximally because we have diastemas and or some slight rotations. So even though you can see a diastema there, you wanna prep through the diastema so that the ceramic is on the lingual. So that the lingual ceramic as it comes out facially creates a contact and then wraps around onto the facial. If you don't reduce, you're gonna have just two wings of porcelain coming off the facials touching each other and it doesn't look anatomically correct, nor will the papilla grow back into place because you haven't truly changed the emergence angle. You just put some wings on the side of a tooth, if that makes sense, okay? So the same as the first case, take your photographs, look at the lip position, see if you think you can tolerate them to have their teeth a little bit thicker. And if they can't, then start looking at what's the limiting tooth or how much has to come off. In her case, her canines are slightly flared out. So when I look at this, I go, okay, the canines are probably gonna have to have a little reduction. The rest of the teeth look pretty good. So how do I prove this? Well, that's where again, models wax up and um, some type of mock-up on their person. Now you can freehand mock-up them with you know, composite and it'll take a little while, or you can send off to the lab for a wax up and do a mock-up very easy on the next appointment, which is something I like to do. And so for my mock-ups, I use what I call a beadline provisional technique. And so that provisional technique can also be used on my mock-ups. And I came out with this back in the early 2000s. So here's the approach. It's not really that difficult and it makes your life so much faster and easier. You've got a wax up, the wax up gets duplicated into a stone model. The stone model you'll scribe some lines into to create um, what I call the bead lines. And those bead lines are anywhere you have a margin at the gum line. And again, I'll walk through the technique more in a minute, but nonetheless, having created these little scribe lines, it creates this um, impression that you can see that I fill that up with acrylic and I put it in the patient's mouth, let it sit on the teeth for the setting time of three to four minutes. And then I pull this off. And so having done so, the little bead lines that I was mentioning, those create a cut point or a cleaving capability by compressing the tissue and or the tooth structure and so it literally puts a cut point on my acrylic that this is what the patient looks like in three to four minutes. Minimal flash, minimal cleanup. Not that I have to clean anything up at this point, but allows the patient to see a possibility. So without ever touching her teeth, I show her this and say, okay, if I could give you this, would you be happy? The teeth are you know, half a millimeter thicker in certain places. And where the canines are rotated, the actual canine is still there on the distal, but on the mesial where it's rotated, the mesial is now, let's say, I don't know, millimeter thick. 
I said, does this look good? Can you tolerate it? What do you think? And she's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah, love it. Perfect. This gives me a tool now, the tool of knowing where I'm going to end before I begin. So now I take my last code depth cutting burr. I can cut into this acrylic and make depth cuts as you can see on the imagery. Same as I would for a tooth. But in this case, I may not even touch the tooth. Based on how thick the wax up is, I may not even touch it. Okay. For this particular case, we probably touched the tooth about two-tenths of a millimeter in certain parts. On the canines, we took a little more off on that distal area that stuck out. And so you can see the incisal edges we went across with the depth cutters as well. Connecting the planes together. Having connected the planes, I packed a cord so I could move the tissue up just a little bit so I can position that uh, margin slightly at or slightly under the gum line. Took photographs for the lab, took my impressions. Minimal reduction. Now she gets to leave with provisionals. Here's the provisionals. Another four minutes to create provisionals and she's out the door. And don't worry, I'm gonna talk about how I do provisionals. But nonetheless, you can see that the provisionals look just like the mock-up and it looked just like the wax up as far as the shape. Now the color is slightly different. I used, based on the initial color of the provisional material I used, I said, so what do you think? Is this color gonna work? And she says, no, can you go a little whiter? I said, no problem. So I'm doing color assessment. I used a B1 provisional material when I did the mock-up. And then when I cut that off, she said, no, no, I think I wanna go a little whiter. I said, no problem, let's look a little whiter. So here we have a bleach shade. Okay. So this particular bleach shade, I think was Lux Attempt from DMG, but the other bleach shade I use and B1 shade I use are from Kettenbach, it's their Vesalis one of the strongest temper materials out there. Uh, really nice coloring, good handling, just like, like most, but they're slightly different colors. Based on what color I'm shooting for, I may pick one versus the other. One's a little bit lighter, the other one's just a hint warmer. Uh, so she looks at this and says, oh yeah, this, this color is really nice, I like this. I said, okay, no problem. You know, she, she decided to call me back a couple of days later, you know, you know what, let's go just a hint whiter. I said, no problem, we can do that. And so in her finals, Having seen two different shades of acrylic, she decided to go a little bit wider. Here's her finals. And so what you'll get from this is, again, the provisionals and finals mimic each other as far as the shape. Now, granted, her smile is slightly different, her lips slightly, or her mouth is slightly more open, but you can see that it's pretty much the same thing within about 95% roughly. So to have someone walk through this process to show them like, hey, look, before I touch you, here's what you could look like. You like this? Great, let's make it. It all flows through seamlessly. So if you want a dogmatic approach, here's the approach, but it takes a little time for you to figure out what that's going to be as far as the model work so that the lab can give you the great product and you can make great provisionals. So I saw another question came in. Let me see what that is. Uh, in attrition cases, do you recommend veneers or crowns? You know, really it's case by case. It's hard to say because if someone's got a lot of damage and wear, I might be opening, well, as most people would say, opening the vertical. I might be repositioning a jaw and creating vertical. There's a, there's a lot of variables. So it's a case by case thing. Uh, another question is, why not take the shade before starting the preparation? That's a good one. Yeah, so I have photos beforehand. And if we're looking at shade communication where the patient can go to the lab, I like the, the lab technician to be able to see their teeth if they're trying to truly match their teeth. But what I was showing you in the imagery, and I didn't say it well enough, so thank you for correcting me so I can go back and, and highlight it, is the reason I take a preparation photograph uh, at the beginning, well, not, let me take it back. I don't, I take my photograph when I get done preparing the tooth structure so the lab can see the prepared tooth, which is different from the tooth uh, when it has the enamel on it. Okay, so as you reduce tooth structure, the color is going to look different. So what I was showing you in that photograph was call it the prepped tooth color or the stump color, whatever you want to call it. And that's why I'm saying try not to let it dehydrate. But if you're just trying to match the adjacent teeth, yeah, that works fine. You can take that picture at the beginning. But the lab technician needs to know and be able to see what's underneath to know how translucent he can make his ceramic to allow underlying color to come through or to mask it. All right. Um, let's see, it was another question that came in. Other than preservation of two structure, what is the advantage of half veneer as opposed to a full veneer? 
uh, that was the whole purpose for me was preserving tooth structure. If that was my daughter in the chair and I can save her tooth and never touch her tooth and just glue something to it, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to do for every patient that walks through my door. Could I have ground off more tooth structure towards the distal of that tooth where it was you know, flared out to make space to put ceramic on? Certainly could have. But my lab technician is skilled enough to be able to put a half veneer on there. By all means, yeah, I'm going to do that. And should it ever fail? No problem. I've got the whole tooth underneath still that's never been touched. Uh, so that's kind of how my approach is. Um, someone else asked, what was the name of the Kettenbach uh, temporary material? Uh, that's known as Visalis, V-I-S-A-L-Y-S. -S. All right, let me continue on. Uh, oh. Uh, someone asked about the half veneers on 6 and 11. What does the prep look like? I didn't prep it at all. There was no preparation. We literally just took impression of the tooth and they made a piece of ceramic that fit on that tooth. Uh, what kind of acrylic do I use for an interroll mock-up? Whatever your favorite acrylic is. Uh, again, I'm using the Vesalis or for this gal that I just showed you, I mentioned it was the Luxatemp. Here's the Luxatemp from DMG. Uh, so I use both. And sometimes, like I said, I'll use the Vesalis first sometimes. And if they say, oh, I don't like that color, I want to go whiter, then I either go the next shade up with a Vesalis or maybe I move to a Luxatemp. So I've got two different materials. Okay? Uh, the great thing, DMG's got the little flowable that matches that if you get a little bubble, you can fill it in. So great questions on the provisionals. Um, I'm someone who, I've got multiple materials. I don't buy just one. And I know a lot of times, Dennis, we want to have one thing that does kind of a lot. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer of having a bag of tricks, meaning I've got multiple products based on whatever's in front of me, I've got a solution, okay? Uh, provisionals, you've probably all tried or have seen the Siltec putty matrices like this one here. Um, having used those once or twice, I said I didn't care for them because uh, I didn't like how thick they were. They had to be thick to give them strength and rigidity and hard getting them into some people's mouths. So me being a, a lab nut, I'd go into my lab and try and figure other things out. And that's when I came up with my beadline technique like I said, back in the early 2000s. And at some point I published it. I think it was like, it says here like 2009, but um, basically all I did was change kind of the process. And so I will walk through that with you. Uh, and it works for any material. So, you know, again, you're asking about materials. I use, I shouldn't say, I've tried every acrylic out there basically. You know, every temporary material I pretty much tried. I have my favorites, uh, which you're seeing in these cases, but any material will work. It just depends on, you know, how, how is the final appearance? Is it an acrylic or bisacryl that looks pretty aesthetically? Does it have good translucency and fluorescence? Uh, do we need something that has great strength for someone who maybe has worn off incisal edges? I'm kind of looking at all those things. Uh, so for me, uh, I use every one of the ones up here and they all have slightly different color properties and slightly different physical handling. So based on what you're trying to accomplish, you can use any of these. Like I said, the Salus is probably the strongest one out there. Um, but I would say maybe like the Lux Temp Ultra, if you're going for some crazy aesthetics with fluorescence, that one might be your favorite. Um, but it really just depends on what you're going for. But the technique I'm showing you works with any of these. So I'm not saying you've got to run out and get stuff, but when your stuff runs out and you need something new, why don't you try some Vesalis or try, you know, Lux Temp or try something else. So you get an idea and then you start to realize what I'm talking about, how it's nice to have some different products if you're doing enough cases. All right, so let's look at provisionals a little more because I know a lot of people like have difficulty with provisionals. It takes a fair amount of time for many. Uh, so there's a hyperlink here. You can see it says beadline provisionals 2009. That hyperlink, uh, if you click on it, will take you to the article to read. Now you're trying to click on it right now is not gonna work. The reason I tell you this is I give you a digital handout. I do this in all my lectures. Every slide I'm showing you is in your digital handout. I will tell you where to get that at the end. But recognize when you go into the digital handout, there are hyperlinks like this that I put in my programs that if you click on it, it takes you right to the information so that you can read stuff, okay? So if you're writing things down, anything I'm saying verbally that you like, write it down. Uh, anything you see on the screen, you have access to, okay? I do it from having sat through numerous lectures where I want a slide or information and the guy went through too fast and I didn't write it down or I lost the paper, I can go back and get it anytime with a digital handout. So hence you have a digital handout. All right, so here's a patient went through ortho because they had functional issues that they worn their teeth down. So we reposition the teeth so the gum lines are lined up so that I don't have to go in and do gum surgery. Even though I love doing it with my lasers and things, uh, 
ideally, I want to maintain as much um, crown to root ratio as possible. I don't want to take more bone away to create more diastema, or not diastema, more black triangles, more gingival issues, and less bone holding the tooth in. So ideally, if I can intrude teeth, that's what I'm going to do. And so having intruded the teeth, this patient obviously has some concerns about the appearance that we need to change. This would be one of those cases where if you're asking me about veneering a tooth, I would say because of the wear on the linguals as well as the length, I'm just gonna crown these front four teeth. I'm gonna probably have better longevity and durability, but I also have to rebuild their function, which you can see there's a fair amount of space from the incisal of the upper to the incisal of the lower, but also there's an overlap there that your veneer ceramic would have to be very thick. And so why not just go a little bit further? You don't have to bury the margin under the gum line on the lingual, but doing a crown gives you some unique advantages. Doing a crown gives you some great retention and resistance form, but also allows you to lose, not lose, allows you to use traditional cements. So I can cement four front crowns with a glass ionomer. Makes my job quick and easy. And then I can you know, use resin adhesives for the veneers. So I'm thinking end game when the patient comes back, Delivery, how hard is my delivery going to be? Can I use cements or do I have to use bonded adhesives? If I can use a cement, I'll use a cement. I think it gives me some distinct advantages as far as um, helping to strengthen a tooth by using something like a glass onomer or a, a ceramere. You know, so there's bioactive materials nowadays that you don't necessarily get in resin cements that you can get from certain cements. So I think in this case, I'm giving the patient an advantage and I'm building in some great strength and longevity as well as getting that retention. So let's look. Took models, did a wax up, duplicated the wax up. We've said it now numerous times for every case. So I practiced my preps, I sent it to the lab, they did the wax up, got it back, duplicated it, or had the lab duplicate it. I now make my beadline over impression, which I talked about previously, but I didn't show you exactly how to do it. Here's where you get to see it. I take any type of sharp instrument. I've got discoid cleoids here. Use a gold foil knife, you know, Bard Parker, whatever you want to use. But you're trying to scribe a line, a half a millimeter to a millimeter, into the tissue and the tooth at the same time. So you literally go right where your margin is going to go on the gum line and you scribe a line. It's real easy. So for this case, because it's crowns, I'm going to scribe on the facial and the lingual for the four anterior teeth. I'm going to scribe a small line right here at the gum line. I'm gonna extend up interproximal. Again, not breaking the contact zone, but I'm gonna get that papilla that goes up interproximal right in here. And if my Bard Parker uh, knife gets in there, I'm gonna use that. If the Clio can get in there, then I'll use that. It just depends on how much space I have. So I'm not really trying to take tooth away here. I'm trying to take the papilla away. Okay, so I'm making a little line around each tooth. Now. I'm going to define my wax up by taking the knife, Bard Parker, 15 blade, whatever you got. I'm not cutting away necessarily stone. I'm just cleaning out any little debris to make the interproximal region slightly more defined. Okay? If you're cutting this, you will find you have individual temporaries and they break off more easily. I'm not trying to break the contacts. I'm just cleaning out any stone debris in here. Okay? There's a, a distinct difference. So just run it through once barely taking anything off just to make sure it's defined because you want the acrylic of every tooth connected because you get strength by all the temporaries connected as one. Okay. So here's the bead line over impression. So you'll notice based on how I scribed, I'm creating these little triangles that go interproximal. I didn't break the contact. They just extend up into the interproximal area. They're very defined. At the gum line on both the facial and the lingual is the bead line that I scribed. So I made an indentation into the model, which creates a positive on the over impression, which allows me when I place it in the mouth to put pressure on the tooth and tissue to cleave the material. So I have virtually no cleanup. It's literally just a big dollop of acrylic separated from the acrylic on the tooth. Now, the one other thing I started doing, you'll notice here, and I'll turn my flashlight on here, You'll notice this is fairly flat. The reason I make this flat and I extend it almost right on top of the margin is so when I press this firmly in the patient's mouth, I mean firmly. So when I, when I try this in for the first time before putting acrylic in it, I try it in just to make sure I line things up. How do I line it up? I know that in between the front two teeth, I put a little mark, I cut a little line into the impression material so I know where to line it up. 
I place it into the mouth to make sure I can get it in easily. And also, so the patient perceives how I'm going to push this in. So gradually I'm putting firmer and firmer pressure. And if the patient's like hundred to 150 pounds, I'm going to tell them like, you're going to slide up my chair, probably half an inch to an inch when I'm pushing on this. So it's not a fast thing. It's just gradual, consistent pressure. And uh, the reason I do this, I'm trying to seat this firmly to get it all the way down. So if there's any excess, let's say on a tooth I didn't prepare or any excess on a lingual of a tooth that's getting a veneer, that acrylic is as thin as possible. And that these marks that I made, these bead lines are going to cleave the material right where I want it. If I don't seat it properly, those cleave lines are gonna be in the wrong point. So hence I test it ahead of time and I'll let the patient know how we're gonna do it. So let's take a look. Here's our teeth, here's our preps. Again, get your photograph so the lab knows what's underneath to allow them to use either a translucent or more opacous ceramic to let colors blend through. I talked about using that bead line technique. So I tried it in already, took it back out, loaded it with my bisacryl, placed it firmly, and then I'm holding it in place. If the set time says three minutes, I'm typically gonna hold it an extra minute because I want it actually to shrink down and tighten on those teeth. If I pull it out when the manufacturer suggests when to pull it out, it might not have shrunk down as tightly, allowing you to retrieve it and cut the excess off and then go back and cement it in place, right? That's what we do for a crown. We don't want to get cut and caught in the undercuts. So for these, I want it to lock on. So the teeth are dry and I put this in the mouth and the acrylic shrink wraps to the teeth and I leave it alone. I don't pull it off to put cement in. It is literally shrunk wrapped to the teeth. Mechanical retention from adjacent teeth hold it in place. This particular one, if you have a good wax up and a good model and you have a good impression of that model that's been modified, all of the characteristics in your over impression get transferred onto the teeth. So if you have some primary anatomy in the tooth structure, all of the embrasure shapes and sizal edges, all of these things you can duplicate extremely well as you can see here. This, I will tell you, is probably one of the best ones I've ever had. But even the last case you saw was pretty phenomenal too. I kid you not, this case right out of the box looks like this. Did not polish it, did not touch it. Walked away, four minutes. My assistants are always dumbfounded. When I get a new assistant, they're like, whoa, how did you do that? Like, that is crazy. It's too easy, okay? Make your life simple. So here it is from the lingual. Again, if you scribe it right, no cleanup. Now you may have to spot the, the bite potentially, you know, because now you've got occlusion on those four incisors. Um, but if the wax up is good and your model works good on an articulator, you won't have to. So here's what she looked like. Okay, it's a big difference from where she came in. So that's how I do my provisionals. I do that for all of my cases. Now, let's say for example, um, we have, Oh, let's say a minimal no prep case. If I have minimal to no prep, I really don't have to put anything on. But like I said, I will just so that someone feels good, you know, and sees where they're going. But I tell them ahead of time, if you knock it off because it's not glued on, you don't need to come back. If you want it put back on, I'll certainly oblige and help you out. But recognize we didn't take anything off or very minimal. So there's not much to hold it on. Now, I know in the past, you know, like when we used to freehand temporaries and we'd have to spot etch the tooth and put a little bonding agent on there, you could still do all those things, but it means taking more time. It also means you have to go back and actually reduce that part of the tooth structure that you infused with resin. I choose not to have to do all that. It's pretty rare I have a temporary come off. You'd be amazed how strong some of these temps are just being held on mechanically. Not sure why I put that photo there. Um, someone usually asks, if you've got deep preparations or cavities or an existing filling, and I don't know if that one came up yet, but um, there's a lot of questions obviously coming in. I will get to them at the end if I didn't get it now. Um, with veneer temps, how do you take them off? I will show that in a moment. So I'm gonna get rid of that question. Okay, um, so let's talk about someone who's got a filling or a cavity. Obviously, if your preparation design removes the filling and the cavity and you don't have that big of a defect, leave it alone because that defect will get filled in with your resin cement the day you put the veneer in. It also may help hold your temporary in slightly because it's a slight undercut, right? 
So it just depends on how much is gone. But obviously, the deeper you go into the tooth, the more risks of sensitivity. Uh, but also, if you have a, a big composite there, you don't want to leave some huge defect and plan on putting a bunch of resin cement in there. So typically, what I'm doing is I'm going back in with usually a resin modified glass animer. Occasionally, I'll use a flowable, uh, but usually I'll use a resin modified glass animer. They have better color stability, less risk of sensitivity, less micro leakage over time. Um, they just have a lot of benefits, not to mention releasing fluoride uh, to help strengthen the tooth. And they create a true uh, adaptation with a tooth structure that you can't get with resins. Uh, so that's why I use them. And so just to go into it briefly, I throw in extra slides here because if you want to go back and read the, the slides and use the, um, the digital handout, this tells you my mentality of why I use things. And it talks about how there's a release of calcium phosphate ions to strengthen the tooth and create a different type of bond, a true chemical bond versus micromechanical, you know, all these wonderful benefits that glass animers have to offer. If you look at them underneath you know, class two restorations under composites, they do dye penetration studies. We obviously know that resins leak more than glass animers through all the research over the years. I mean, that's, that's the problem with resins is they do leak and break down with time. And so there's numerous research articles that talk about that as far as, you know, hey, resin modified glass onomers work better both as self-cure or light cured uh, over, you know, resins or flowables in proximal boxes and cavo surfaces. Um, so it, they just provide a better seal. It's a uniquely different product. And so not to harp on this, but where resins have shrinkage and contraction and failure, just by the nature of how they adhere to the tooth, which we see in SEMs. Uh, we also know water tree effects, you know, all these different things we know are there. We can't quantify them, but we know they're there. And so you see it with time, either in sensitivity or leakage. What you find with glass onomers is you get this acid-base resistant zone where the dentin is actually stronger and more impervious to acid attacks and cavities by having placed glass ionomer onto the dentin. And so that's why I use it. And because it has resin inside of it, I can get some resin to resin adhesion as far as my uh, resin cement, my looting cement uh, from the veneer onto the restoration. But also I'm always extending beyond my materials. So I always have a margin of two structure. So this would be sandwiched underneath my veneer in the resin cement, okay? All right. So if you're not familiar with glass ionomers, that's why I use them. Now, as far as materials go, you can see the defect here. A little class five, could you use a, you know, a flowable bonding agent? Sure. Um, me, I personally go in with the glass owner, which I told you the benefits, it's there. My favorite product is the Fuji 2LC. I've been using it for close to 30 years. Uh, it's been modified and continues to get better, but phenomenal material with great track record. So this is my go-to, a resin modified glass ionomer. If you don't have a triturator, they do make it as an auto mix. Uh, so you can now have it right there, chair side in a gun and inject it onto the tooth very easily. So when someone says, hey, glass animers don't look good, I would disagree and say they look every bit as good. Okay. So this is what I'm implementing. If someone has like, let's say a, a class three, a class four, a class five composite that's old, it's discolored, it's got funny margins that I want to remove. Uh, that's what I'm typically going in with. Now, if I've prepped the tooth, I've taken my impressions, uh, I've made provisionals, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of different things in that category that we didn't hit on. So let me hit on a couple of things briefly there. I told you I used the heat wave trays. You saw it earlier. Uh, just to run through these quickly, they're thermoplastic so that I can get a good fit on anybody. Stock trays don't give you that advantage. You're potentially going to the next size up to get it to fit. Now you got a lot of goop in someone's mouth unless you're using a scanner. Uh, they have four sizes for the upper, four sizes for the lower. It's got a caliper. You can measure on your models. You can measure it in the mouth. You can take it to the little diagram that comes with it. Find the size that works best. You'd be amazed at how well these fit. This is untouched. Look at the adaptation on that. The adaptation is crazy. Now, if it doesn't fit though, you throw it in your favorite water bath and everyone's got the water bath that I use. Looks like this. One minute and a cup in the microwave. The water, I should say the water, not the, not the tray. Uh, throw the water in the microwave for a minute, pull it out, drop the tray in it. Tray becomes pliable. And uh, I guess it depends on the power of your microwave, but usually about a minute in my microwave. Um, but it becomes pliable. And now I take it to the model and where it was, let's say, binding, instead of going to the next size up, 
I'm going to just bend this and make it work. But now I get crazy adaptation all across the whole facial and the lingual, allowing me to take an impression using less material. Less material is more accurate. It's also faster and easier because it's compressing the material up around the teeth. So I have some thin impression material for accuracy, and it's also forcing material to some extent under the gum line, which sounds weird, right? We pack a cord to move the gum line out of the way. Well, if you can force material under the gum line, you don't have to pack cord, do you? As far as going and, and placing materials, these are two little syringes. Um, I think it's Practicon sells them, and I think Clinician's Choice sells them. But I love using these because these two little metal cannulas for veneers allows me to put for let's say lower interior veneers, I use the blue one. And for uppers, I'm typically using the yellow. But that little canyon allows me to get into proximal or into tight areas to inject material uh, into the gum line. But from there, obviously using a heavy body along with my light body syringed material, using that tray, I can literally force materials under the gum line. It's crazy what you can do if you haven't obviously damaged gum tissue and they're not bleeding and they don't have gum disease, you can actually force material down into the sulcus, which I know sounds weird, but it's possible. Do I still pack cord? Yes. Do I use a laser to trough occasionally? Yes. Does it work for everyone? No. But here's what I'm using for a lot of my cases. And obviously, again, I use everything, but I'll tell you, this is one of my go-to favorites. Uh, Kettenbach says their sells their Panacil line, and you'll see they've got it both in the guns as well as the large auto mixes. And they have numerous viscosities based on whatever your favorite preference is. Uh, I can tell you, I like the putty, the orange or the heavy body, uh, the green one here. I typically use something very thick and very firm. These are older pictures. Obviously, I wasn't using the thermal plastic trays, but I've been using this for years. Okay. And then I typically use a light body or a medium body in my syringe. Okay. All right. So what's so special about it? You know, impression material. Hey, you know, everyone sells impression material. I like it personally because of the set times. They're fast set, sets nice and quick, but they also have one that takes a long time to set up, uh, which I want for my bigger cases. If you look at the contact angle, the hydrophilicity, it has one of the lowest ones on the market. And I know everyone says that, but they're not usually comparing good products against their product. They're usually picking weaker products, right? So this is comparing against many of the products we've all used as far as Impergum and Aquacil. They're two great products. I use both of those too, uh, but this is my go-to. So when you put you know, some water down onto the impression materials, what you're looking at is the contact angle is how flat will a material set? That basically determines its hydrophilicity. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see where water's laying down substantially. And on the other one, it's not. So one material is gonna work very well under the gum tissue, the others won't. And I can tell you Kettenbach, which makes a lot of materials for many other companies, uh, does a phenomenal uh, job of making incredible materials. And they actually have guarantees behind it. If you don't like it, they'll take it back. Uh, so I would tell you to try it if you're not happy with what you have or you wanna see something different. So here's again, that test, you know, the Panacil versus a competitor, you can see the difference. It, it's pretty crazy. So again, com comparisons, you have all these in there. If you wanna go back and look at these, comparing good products against um, the Panacil. But for me, it's all about working in the mouth. What I see in the mouth is also important. So here was an example. I was literally doing a gold MOD uh, restoration and this back tooth was cracked and needed to be extracted. So I was going to take my impression first before it started you know, bleeding from an extraction. And I wasn't even thinking about this back tooth. So it wasn't like I was drying it off. I wasn't trying to isolate the back tooth. I literally just dried the tooth in front of it to take my impression. And this cracked tooth, pretty substantial, obviously, you know, going down uh, the root structure. So having taken my impression with the Panacil, this is what I got. And so this is going way back to my rimlock trays. Rimlock trays had no perforations, So it forced materials down into the tissues around teeth. That's why I use them. But what you notice here is this tail, this tail coming out of this fractured tooth that you know, had saliva and fluid and stuff in it. You can see it's almost you know, 12 millimeters long. So it actually made its way down there, but also had the ability to uh, not be torn. So its tear strength was good to come back out. Uh, so pretty crazy. And that's that, would, that sold me and I've been very happy ever since as far as its moisture capabilities and its tear strength. Um, but I will say again, because of set times for my larger cases when I'm doing full mouth rehabilitations, you know, whether it's a bunch of veneers or veneers and crowns, whatever, I want something that's gonna take a little longer to set up. So where I'd used Impergum in the past, polyethers are great. Uh, they work well in moist environments, 
But to have the best of a polyvinyl and polyether together is why I started using the Identium, which is their uh, polyvinyl siloxane ether type of product. So a vinyl siloxane ether. So at the best of both worlds, basically. So you're getting the moisture capability and friendliness as well as the strength and durability and flow capabilities of, of the um, polyvinyl and mixing them together, you get a great product. So whether I'm doing one or two teeth in a, a kind of a, a, let's say a bloodier, more difficult environment, I may jump to this. If I'm doing a large case with a bunch of teeth, I will jump to this. If I need a longer working time, if I have someone that's sedated, uh, this is what I'm going to. So again, you've got all these for your notes. So again, you can see some single teeth, large full mouth. This is my go-to for these types of things. So I'm, I'm no longer using Impergum. So again, for little veneer cases, like the cases we're looking at, you know, something like this. So again, you can see the thermoplastic tray, how thin and how adapted it is. And you'll also notice, you'll see that light body is strewn across the occlusal surfaces of all the teeth to get rid of all the bubbles and porosities to try and get the best model possible to uh, equilibrate and utilize uh, to get the best fit possible is why I do that. All right. Okay, so there's my impressions. Now, if you have to take a bite registration, like for some of these patients that um, you know have anterior changes, we're changing occlusion, whatever, I would tell you to look at, again, Kettenbach. I like the Futar D, but the reason I like them is they have options for everything, whether you want to scan it, whether you like something flimsy or rigid, uh, they've got one for everybody. But I use the Futar D, and uh, that is my go-to because I can cut it with a scalpel and it sets up very rigid. Okay. Someone was asking about temporary cements. This is the cement I use. When you asked, someone asked earlier about if my temporary comes off, if I have a minimal prep and it comes off and the patient wants me to put it back on, this is my go-to. It's from Ultradent, Clear Temp LC. I literally dry the tooth, dry the temporary, put this in the temporary, squish it back on the tooth, wipe off the excess, hit it with a curing light, they're done and gone. I don't have to etch, I don't have to bond, I don't have to numb the patient up. It's too simple, too easy. And I've been amazed how well this holds things on. If you happen to use this for a crown temporary, that crown is not coming off, unless there's no preparation. You know, if it's, an, if it's a normal prep, you will not get this off. You'll have to cut the temporary in half. It's amazing how strong this stuff is. I've had veneer temps fly across the room when I'm trying to flick them off a tooth. Okay, so this is a fabulous product. Uh, mixed provisionals, whether I've got veneers, crowns, implants, I still use this same beadline technique. So here's a bunch of prep teeth. We talked about cords earlier. I use unimpregnated cords. There's no, no hemostatic in them. If I need a hemostatic, because there were questions on this, if I need a hemostatic, I'm typically going to either a 25% aluminum sulfate, which would be something like tissue goo, or I'm going to a 25% aluminum chloride, which is a viscostat clear. Viscostat clear comes from Ultradent. It's made to not leave that black scuzz. Tissue goo from clinician's choice, the aluminum sulfate, again, same thing, will not leave that black scuzz. The scuzz you're seeing, if that's what you wanna call it, that is you're using some type of aluminum, um, not aluminum, um, ferric uh, sulfate. And so you have iron and the iron is oxidizing. That's what that yellow kind of funny color is. When it oxidizes, it turns black. So what you're seeing is iron bits that are still there when you take the provisionals off, or if you didn't wash it away well enough, it's under your veneer and you can see it. That's because you use the wrong hemostatic agent. So use one of these two if you're gonna use one or jump to a laser, okay? Uh, so a laser will work as well. If you're wondering about materials, this happens to be Visalis. And so I threw a little Teflon tape over the implant so I could floss just like a bridge. I pulled that Teflon tape out. Now someone can floss over it. Okay, so that beadline technique you can see works here, just like it does for veneers, crowns, you name it. That's my go-to. Okay, so those are all shrunk wrap. So all right, here's the final product. Okay. Um, this was nice because I could cement certain teeth with cements and I could bond the other ones on with you know, resin cement. So we're gonna get into cementation here next. Uh, so it gave me the distinct advantage on crowns that I can loot them in with traditional um, cements and the veneers I could put in with resins. So again, options. 
If you're wondering about the cement, uh, one of the ones I mentioned was the Fuji Sim. And so you've got information here on the resin modified glass onomer. Nice thing about this, you don't have to triturate it. So you can literally use it right there chair side. All right, uh, let's go ahead and look at the next case. Wrap it up here with cementation. We'll run through a case. Here's the patient showing her what's possible. And so she says, yeah, it looks great. Let's do it. We run through everything we talked about already. We make our models, figure out where we want to go with it, do our wax ups, preparation designs and wax ups. Okay, so after having done that, send it off to the lab. Okay, so all the stuff we talked about, lab comes back with a wax up. We're happy with it, patient signs off on it. And we've got our reduction guides that we talked about earlier. Those are made from the stone models off the wax up. So those are prepared before the patient gets in. So we've practiced, we've had all our guides. The lab's got their guides. We can do the other guides that, you know, that are bleach trays that are flimsy with holes in it. You've got all this information we talked about. We talked about um, preparation designs, A, B, and C. We talked about reduction guides, even though I don't recommend this type. That's another one we talked about. And so for her case, we showed fairly minimal reduction cases. This one's more extensive. And this is where you saw me try this technique, but ultimately I like this technique on the right. Um, you can see the patient obviously gonna need extensive reduction because of the spaces between the teeth, the length that's been lost. And so we're gonna modify a lot of things here, All right? So we're gonna modify gum tissues first using a laser. I'm using ultra dense laser. So we modified the tissues to line the gum lines up. We do our depth cuts. You can see those from the Lasco burrs. You've got marks. Packed my cords. Now I could have just used the laser, right? You know, to go and do my gingival troughing. I don't know why I didn't, but for whatever reason, I packed cord in this case. Uh, maybe it was just to hold the tissues back. I don't know. So nonetheless, you can see we've got a lot of preparation designs. We've got kind of um, B styles on the front four and maybe a little bit of a C style where we've wrapped over on the canines. And then uh, it looks like... Um, a little more of a um, traditional crown preparations on the premolars because I think she already had crowns or had big amalgams. But nonetheless, you can see is more extensive reduction. We're now into dentin. We're using press ceramics for more durability. Could you use multi-layer zirconias nowadays? Certainly, you certainly can. So again, provisionals derived from the wax up. We talked about the bead line technique and how everything's gonna lock on. So she literally has 10 teeth locked on, no glue, right? There's no temporary cement. She's done and out the door. Now someone asked, okay, how are you getting those off? Here's how we get them off. Patient comes back in, you numb them up. I grab my prep model. With the prep model, I, um, I look to see where I can cut through in approximately. I look to see my preparation designs. And so I don't wanna touch the tooth, right? I don't wanna modify the preparation design. If I were to happen to touch the tooth, where would I wanna touch the tooth if I were to happen to touch it? Well, on the facial or lingual or incised ledge is okay, but not a margin, okay? So if I'm cutting up the facial of a tooth and across the incisal and down the lingual, but I'm staying off the margin, I stop short and I do a little bit of reduction, let's say in between the teeth, if I've broken the contact and can get a burr in there without hitting a tooth, I'll do that as well. But basically what I'm trying to do is take some space away that I can go in with a crown key and very lightly press on each one of them until I hear a little click or a pop. And I let the patient know they're going to hear that. Okay, let them know you're going to hear a click or pop. It's not your tooth. It's the temporary. Do not try to, excuse me, do not try and force these apart. If it's not clicking somewhere easily, then go ahead and do a little more reduction. By creating the reduction, you create space that a temporary can move laterally. So you get that little click. And as soon as you get one off, the rest all start to fall off very easily. Okay. So that's how we get them off. So here's where she started. Here's where she ended. Little tissue uh, irritation still from the laser, but nonetheless, very similar to what she saw in her mock-up, right? So that's how I get the provisionals off on these more complex cases. So you're seeing it's, it's all the same process. The only thing that's really changing is how I handle the tissues and how much tooth I prepare. So if you're looking for systematic, it is systematic if you figured it out ahead of time. And granted, I'm jumping over a lot of stuff because we only have an hour and 40 minutes. But I want you to get the basic understanding here of how simple it can be. And really with practicing, it allows you to get there. Now for the same token, this lady who I prepared, I don't know, back in late 2009, I'm assuming, 
somewhere around there, maybe 10. Um, you can see she already had wear on her teeth and her teeth were flaring out from functional movements and we had made her a guard. And so I would tell you, anyone that's got wear on their teeth needs to wear a guard. Now it's up to them if they're gonna wear it or not. So pretty much anyone that comes into my office, if they had wear on their teeth and we fixed it with veneers, I tell them like, look, here's your insurance plan, use it. If you don't, doesn't bother me, but you might break something or maybe something will move. So here she is nine years later, I saw her and I said, hey, by the way, you're not wearing your guard. She says, what? I'm like, yeah, you're not wearing your guard. And she's like, oh, uh, uh. you know, of course she feels a little guilty about it because I'm, I'm telling her she's not wearing it. And she says, no, I'm not. I said, well, let's take a picture. And I show her nine years later what her teeth look like. And I said, look, you're wearing your teeth down. She's like, oh my goodness. Now she wears her guard or so she tells me. <laughs> All right. So we need to, um, again, there's a review slide for you to go back and look at when you get my digital handout. But we need to hit on cementation and we got like, Oh, probably another 15 minutes here and then we'll answer whatever questions I didn't get to. Let me take one more peek because I know there's a few in there that just popped in. Um, blah, 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 blah. Someone asked me, had I tried indentium and pressure material? Yes, the materials I show you, I use. Um, so yeah, I've used all materials pretty much that are out there just because of my role at different companies. I shouldn't say companies, like Reality, where you get to evaluate products at Catapult, which you're watching this is on Catapult. We evaluate manufacturers' products and give feedback. And so I've tried just about everything over the years. And obviously certain things work well in my hands and other things I may not like just because of the handling capabilities. So yeah, uh, I do use all these. Uh, so I hope that answered your question. Um, all right, so a couple of questions. We haven't gotten into cementation yet, but the question, there is a question here is, do you sandblast preparations before cementation? Uh, yes, I do, or I will use a non-profi paste, you know, just sand. Like you can just buy pumice that has no uh, chemicals in it. It's just sand. Put a little dab of water in it and you can use that to clean the teeth also. So yes, uh, cleaning the teeth you can do with either. I will tell you sandblasting, if you hit the tissues, instantly you start getting someone bleeding, it becomes a nightmare. So I stopped doing that so much. I still on occasion will, but I kind of gravitated more towards the Profi Cup, uh, but you gotta be careful with that too. Uh, the other thing that I was using, um, Kerhave, uh, I don't know if they still make it, I still have some leftovers, but they're like these little rubberized burrs that clean the tooth. Uh, so you might contact Kerhave Have is H-A-W-E, but you can probably find it through Kerr. Uh, those clean the teeth as well. Uh, someone else asked, any special considerations for veneers on peg laterals? Peg laterals are great because you usually don't have to prepare much of anything. You just got to make sure you have a good line of draw. Uh, so again, it's usually you're going to have the ceramic on the incisal, the facial, and the interproximals. So your big question is, can I seat it onto the interproximals? So that's really, again, going back, you saw me using a literally a removable partial denture surveyor from dental school. Uh, I will survey things to make sure I can get the right draw when I'm actually practicing in my lab before the patient comes in. Uh, so yeah, it's a good question. Uh, someone asked who deals with these materials in Toronto. Honestly, don't know. I'm sorry. I, I'm just I'm just a dentist. I'm not a manufacturer or a dealer or anything like that. So I, I couldn't tell you where to get it, but I'm sure the contact people here from Kettenbach or Bisco or GC uh, can tell you where to get it. Uh, so you can probably pose that to the manufacturers that are uh, potentially here or can get you the information. All right. Uh, so I'm going to leave those last questions until after cementation. Okay, so if you've taken the provisionals off, we talked about cleaning the tooth already, which is great. Thanks for asking that question. If you have placed a margin under the gum line, you can do one of a couple of things. You can place a cord. Again, I'll use a non-impregnated cord. And if you're very careful, you can push the cord up under the gum line and push the tissue out of the way so you have the ability to go in and cement something. If you have, let's say, tissues that are irritated or in the way, I typically am not going to try and use a cord and hemostatic agents. I'm typically going to jump right into using a laser to cauterize tissue and get the tissue out of the way altogether and then let it heal back into position. Okay. But um, that's where, again, when you're practicing your preparation designs and determining where you're going to put your margins, you should already kind of know where you may have problems on the day of cementation or adhesion. I guess you'd call it either one. If you're cementing something, 
you have to have a certain amount of thickness of a ceramic for strength, but you also have, have to have retention. And so really the only time we can use a cement is crowns. So you saw in one case where I did four crowns and four veneers on the uh, canines and premolars. Um, so there are times in which we obviously can use cements where a veneer really should just go a little bit further and become a crown to make our life easier. And so you have the distinct advantage of margins being under the, the gum line or having a little moisture involved where glass onomers and uh, calcium aluminate cements and bioactive cements uh, don't mind a little bit of moisture. So you have that advantage. So recognize that. But we're talking about veneers and adhesion. So really, we're not going to talk about cements. We're going to talk about bonded adhesion with resins. So that aside, margin placement becomes an important discussion because if you can't control isolation, you're not going to get a good marginal seal. So ideally, putting the margin slightly above the gum line or right at the gum line, or if you have good control to put it ever so slightly under the gum line can be done, but you're kind of picking and choosing which case. Obviously, if someone has bad hygiene and the gums are inflamed, you want to get the tissues under control before you ever start the case. But if there's someone that just doesn't control stuff, no matter how hard you try, well, then you better make sure that you have either you know, a technique that allows you to put something in or keep your margin in place that you can control isolation. Now, what is isolation? For me, isolation is uh, an obtrugate gate from Ivoclar, which holds the lips out of the way and keeps the mouth slightly open. Or Alterant's got a new one. I forget the name of it. It's pretty slick. Um, I don't use rubber dams because most people, if they're doing veneers, usually aren't ligating and putting a rubber dam on and it becomes a nightmare. Um, so most people are using cotton rolls and just drying things with saliva ejectors. So the technique is you can either use bonded adhesive resins where you're using an adhesive agent and a resin or you could use self-adhesives, which I don't recommend, or you can use dual cure resins, right? So you got light cure, dual cure, adhesive with a bonding agent or just straight resin adhesive cement. What would I use and why? Let's go into that and how do I use them? So again, you have on the right side, you've got a light cured cement, you've got a dual cured on the left. Why do we use one versus the other? If I'm doing veneers, 99.99% of the time I'm using light cured and my material of choice is the choice two from Bisco. Um, I've recently tried using Ibeclar's product, very nice as well. Uh, different handling, uh, I think I'm just biased to the Bisco choice two because I've been using it for 25 years. Uh, I love the handling, I love the product, um, but nonetheless other products will do the same thing, but you want it light cured. Why do you want it light cured? Because if you're using a dual cured and something isn't positioned properly, and it's starting to set up on its own, you're sunk, it's in the wrong place, right? You can't just pull it off and move it over. So I would tell you dual cured is only for uh, a crown that I can't get light through it and I wanna make sure it sets on its own or I have some crazy big veneers that have such opacity built into them that I don't think the light may get through as well. That would be the only time I would think about doing it. But the problem is positioning. If something moves, you're sunk. So I typically will never use a dual cure for veneers. I'll use it for my inlays, onlays, and crowns instead. The Choice 2 system is great because it comes with uh, the Z Prime Plus. So if you're doing zirconia, uh, or sorry, it doesn't come, <laughs> I'm thinking about zirconia for a second. Um, it comes with the Albon Universal. It comes with the, uh, the etchant for etching the two structure. Uh, which is their uni etch, which has benzyl conium chloride in it. I'll get to it in a moment. It comes with um, uh, the phosphoric acid to etch the ceramic, should it be necessary. It comes with a silanes. It comes with a unfilled resin. It comes with um, the five different shades of resin cements. It comes with everything basically you need to put a veneer on. So it's a, it's a great kit for that purpose. Now, can you order things individually? Sure. And that's what I basically do after having the initial kit is I buy replacements of individual parts. So let's look at kind of the process. You got a patient, uh, two front teeth, you're gonna prep for veneers. You do your preparations, you take your impressions, you take your photographs. We talked about all these things already. You made your provisionals. Patient comes back in the provisionals two weeks later, you're gonna try things in. I say try things in because you want to make sure things fit before you cement. Okay. So the ceramic, you're going to make sure at try in that the lab has already etched it properly, that it's frosty everywhere. If it's not, you're going to have to etch it. 
And so fortunately, the Bisco Choice 2 kit comes with an etch in it. So you can etch your ceramic, right? But if you're gonna put it in the patient's mouth, when it comes out of the patient's mouth, it's gonna be contaminated. So you either have to clean the contaminant off after you've tried it in, or you have to put some type of silane or primer on it before you put it in the mouth to help act as a barrier. You can go either way. We'll talk about that more in a second, don't worry, because I know that this becomes a question for many. So silanes are an interesting chemistry. You have pre-hydrolyzed silanes that have water in them, and those are gonna be single vials. So you can see a single vial on the right, you can see a single bottle uh, in the center. Let me get my laser pointer on. So here's a vial, use it once, you throw it away. There's also little plastic pipettes where you can use it once and throw it away. Bisco has their silane. Uh, it has, any of these have shorter lifespans or shorter shelf lives because they have water in them. A dual bottle system like this um, bis silane A and B here, because the water is separated, they have longevity. So if you're not doing a lot of veneer cases, this is probably the one you wanna pick. So it's gonna have better shelf life. So you're not buying more product, okay? Um, the reason I, I point out the silanes is you wanna pre-silinate your restorations. By pre-silinating your restorations before trying them in. You know, silinate them like 10 minutes ahead, half an hour ahead, an hour ahead, any, time, any chance you get beforehand, silinate them. Because it puts a little bit of a kind of a seal or barrier so that the ceramic is easier to get cleaned for adhesion purposes, okay? So having put this on ahead of time, you're gonna utilize a try-in paste. What is a try-in paste for? Don't use water. I hear people using water. Don't use water because the water gets absorbed into the tooth and or because it's not very viscous, it leaches out from underneath. So if you're using water to try in a restoration and the water goes away, you're getting misled as far as what the color appearance is. When a veneer is optically connected to a tooth, meaning you have some type of water or gel, something in between, it connects them because the airspace is gone. If the air is present, that air creates a whiter appearance. So you want to use a try-in gel that's water soluble. So think of like a, think of like a KY jelly, okay? Not that we're using that, but the dental manufacturers like Bisco, their choice to product has try-in paste. I just buy 99% of the time clear try-in paste. And 1% of the time I'll have a milky white try-in paste also. So in trying it in the patient's mouth with a clear translucent try-in paste, it's viscous enough that it holds the veneer in place that it doesn't just slide off. But also the try-in paste doesn't just leach out or wash out. So I get a good color evaluation. If I need something slightly whiter, I can always go to the whiter try and paste and see if that makes a difference. But I allow the patient to see what's possible. And if they say, hey, it looks great, then we glue it in. If for some reason it's not, then we obviously have to make some modifications and have a discussion, okay? So this is a try-in. At the same time, the try-in not only is to look at the color, but we're making sure the fit is correct. You know, are the margins in the right place? Uh, are they, um, they have good adaptation? Are my interproximal contacts too tight? Are they hindering the veneer from seating all the way? And if they are, I need to obviously adjust the ceramic. And after I've adjusted, I have to polish it. And then I'll go back, try it in again, make sure it fits. And if, if it fits and looks good, then we're good to go. Do I check the contact with um, dental floss? Like, do I floss the contact? No. I should be able to see that things are seated and see that there's a contact. I typically don't try to floss things because if you're pushing things on and you push too hard or something moves and you either break something or something falls off, you got a problem. So typically I check on a solid model and I check by looking in the patient's mouth. So I'm never flossing the contacts, unlike a crown. As far as isolation goes, the veneer, we had already tried it in. It was a water soluble paste. So I can literally just rinse the tooth off. The tooth is good to go. Now the veneer on the other hand, the veneer is water-soluble try and paste. I can rinse that off. And having rinsed it off with water, I'm pretty much good to go. However, I would say have some alcohol or some acetone and put your veneers into either a little dish or a bag, you know, like a Ziploc and drop it in your ultrasonic with either alcohol or acetone just to clean anything that's there. Uh, certainly makes a nice difference. If you have a steam cleaner, 
Uh, you could also just steam clean it, um, but you want to try and clean those as best as possible. So just rinsing it off isn't the best, but it will work, obviously. But ideally, if you're taking the extra step, that's advantageous. You'll notice the Optra gate is holding lips out of the way. It helps open the mouth a little bit. Uh, I've then taken some Mylar strips and put those interproximal so I can't etch the adjacent teeth. And if you want to use Teflon, uh, you know, plumber's tape, you could, but since I haven't broken the contacts, you're not going to get that tape through the contact. So I have both based on what I have in front of me. I only isolate the most distal tooth because I don't want to etch up against the adjacent tooth or I want to try and avoid it as much as possible. Now I say etch because the majority of time I'm still on enamel. If I'm on dentin, I'm still someone that may etch, okay? Uh, if you want to do a selective etch and put etchant only on the enamel and use a universal bonding agent to go on everything, you can do that as well. But the majority of time, I'm just getting etchant on everything. So here you can see the things are etched. Uh, again, I'm using the uni etch, which has benzoclonium chloride in it. And so that helps kill bugs, which is great but also it comes in the kit for you. So again, to make life simple, to have one kit, you pull out the box, everything is there and ready to go every time. I then, I use All Bond Universal for all my adhesives, whether it's you know composites or crowns, inlays, onlays, et cetera. This is my go-to. It's one bottle for everything. And so I'm putting numerous layers onto the tooth. So the tooth may start kind of with a frosty appearance. And by the time I get done, it looks more um, uh, kind of wet, I would say. Why am I using All Bond? Uh, I've got a great podcast coming up with uh, Viva Learning that we're going to go into bonding agents and talk a lot more about them. But basically, the reason I like this bonding agent, it's got a lot of research behind it, but it's a single bottle that allows me to do everything. I can use this for, again, all my direct restorations, all my indirect restorations, all of my buildups, all my light cured and dual cured materials. I don't have to have an additional bottle. I can use it for a total etch technique a self-etch technique, or a selective etch technique. It gives me everything in one bottle. But the other thing that's extremely important for what you're doing here for bonding for a veneer is a thin film thickness. If you apply this properly and air thin it, you can get an, a, a, a thickness or a, a resin layer, let's say, of adhesive that's less than 10 microns. So your film thickness is very small. If you're using a material that has a, uh, a highly filled, thicker uh, film thickness, you may not get your veneer to seat if you've cured your bonding agent, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Now, again, as I said, applying multiple coats on here. I'm not light curing in between each coat. I'm just going back and forth to the dappen dish numerous times and applying this so it looks like it's been completely coated and it's moist. I then blow off the excess. Having done so, I now have this appearance and I'm gonna hit it with my curing light. So you don't want any pooling or puddling and you want a thin film thickness of adhesive. So after hitting it with my curing light, I now turn back to my veneers. And this is where, again, this modeling resin that comes in the kit, it is an unfilled resin. So you do not want much of this on there. It's only acting like, let's say, a, a surfactant or a lubricant. So an extremely thin amount just to allow your resin cement to slide easily. This is used so that the resin cement, when you load it up, the resin cement slides easily on the veneer so you're not getting bubbles. Think of like when you pour up a, an impression with stone. You usually spray a surfactant on there to allow the stone to penetrate into all the the nooks and crannies, let's say, of your impression. That's basically what this is doing. It's allowing you to get better adaptation for the resin to adhere, or I shouldn't say adhere, to lay down and touch the ceramics. So you're not getting bubbles. So again, all this benefits, all the product is in one kit. And that's why I use it. Okay, so that's the Choice 2 kit from Bisco. So again, everything's there. The, the resin cement, I love the handling of it. It has great color stability. You can buy them individually. So again, I just buy the translucent and the, uh, the milky white. And that's my go-to. If I have, again, something where I need dual cure capabilities, like a crown, then I move to the dual link product, which is basically the same thing, but it's a dual cure product, a dual cure resin. Okay, So that's the difference in them. Now, once I have these seated, 
with the resin inside, you'll notice there's a bunch of excess. All of this excess, you can do one of two things. You can either hit it with a light to tack it in place and then clean off the majority of the excess, or you can cure everything to completion and then clean off the excess once it's solidified. It's kind of one or the other. I'm of the mindset that I don't want to try and tack something because if you tack something and something else is slightly off when you push this one down to tack it, you can't move things around. I also don't care for tacking for me personally that if some bleeding starts, like from you trying to clean out a contact from flossing or something, and this either happens to break off or you cause bleeding, now that blood goes up under that veneer and you can't get it off. So I'm not a fan of trying to do spot tacking to try and clean everything up. It's gonna take a little more effort, but I'd rather cure everything 100% and then have to cleave off or, or remove any excess. Now, granted, I'll remove let's say 85, 90% of the excess and leave a small thin line on my margin that I have to clean off. So I'm not gonna just leave all the excess uh, that's hardened or not, uh, I'm not gonna just leave a bunch of excess and wait to clean off when it's solidified. I will clean off a bulk of it, but I will not have tried to cure anything ahead of time if that makes sense. So literally I put it on 90% of the bulk excess, I wipe off, I never floss. I don't wanna potentially cause bleeding or displacement. Uh, or pull resin out of an interproximal area. So that means once I hit it with my curing lights, if everything went at the same time, if I got six veneers all at the same time and I got two curing lights, I'm curing everything at the same time, that means there's gonna be some stuff glued together. So going interproximal, I use these little saws from Contact EZ. And so these allow me to go in and break the contact, stripping out the resin. It's basically a little hacksaw. And so it's a little smooth metal blade with teeth on it. So I'm literally just trimming away the resin. Now, if I have a tight contact, they do make one that, or I shouldn't say one, they make numerous ones that have uh, diamond coatings based on if you wanna try and adjust the ceramic. Um, so they do have a different system based on what you're trying to accomplish. But this is a question I get all the time is how do you get the glue out from between the teeth if you didn't clean it out? This is how I clean it out. It's not that difficult. But basically I clean off all the excess after it's already hardened and in place. Okay. All right. So an hour and 50 minutes later, we've hit on a lot of stuff, but yet there's so much more information to be covered. Uh, let me hit on a couple more things here and then I'll continue to answer questions for the next like 15 minutes. Um, so we're going we're gonna to do Q&A right now. Um, so just give me one second to pull up one more slide here. Obviously bouncing through a lot of stuff. Um, there's so much more to understand and learn. And part of what I alluded to earlier is there's more to dentistry than just learning a technique. There's so much more when it comes to the marketing, the advertising, the business aspect of it, the sales aspect of it. Um, and so not only you know, do I teach regular restorative dentistry, occlusion, photography, all these fun things, but we get into a lot of stuff inside my private groups. So I throw a couple of slides in that are in your handout that reference basically to my groups, whether it be an advertising marketing group, uh, like Singularity, whether it's a, uh, a case acceptance communication uh, system like Inception, we have a lot of stuff there. Uh, so I throw these in just because a lot of people are not aware of where you can find these things. I also throw in a bonus slide and I'm just gonna give it to you for a second here. You're not gonna be able to copy anything down, but legal documentation is important. And so that slide you will have in your handout. So I purposely didn't show it to you because we got to move on to Q&A. Um, but there's extra slides I've thrown into your handout and uh, to hopefully give you a little more information since we had to blast through this. Knowing that we blasted through this, uh, we can certainly come back and talk about many other aspects in future programs, but at least it gives you some good fundamentals, right? So we'll get to your questions in a second. For your digital handout, for those that already got their questions answered and decide they got to go, I understand you know time zones and whatnot, uh, Den Tools. This is an important slide. Write this one down. Den Tools, D E N T O O L Z dot com. This is where you're going to get your digital handout. It's got various types of product offers and specials, things that I use. Uh, there's also free business things, free ebooks and PDFs and stuff that I think are very valuable. Uh, so, a lot of great stuff there. I get nothing, zero from it. It's solely to help you out as you know, my colleague. And for having sat through this, it's solely to help you out. Uh, there are discounts from various manufacturers. 
they give that to you basically saying, hey, we'd love for you to try our product. Snyder uses it and loves it. If you want to try it, you get a discount for having listened to his program. Again, I get nothing from these companies. It's what I use every day. Uh, but Den Tools is where you're going to go. Just to tell you how this works, when you go to Den Tools, this is what it looks like. You put in your name and your email address. If you want to leave any questions or comments or feedback or just appreciation, please do so. I read all of these. Uh, but your email has to be correct because you are going to be sent back a link that gets you into the page that has all the information. There are numerous handouts on that page. There are numerous uh, eBooks and PDFs and helpful information and whatnot. I made it easy. Yours, your handout is at the bottom of the page. But anything on that page is yours to take. Come back and as often as you want, uh, come back and, and get a new link because uh, those change occasionally. But nonetheless, you're always welcome to come back. There's all kinds of different lectures on there from various topics uh, over the last few months. I only leave handouts up there typically for a month or two and then they're gone. So make sure you get it, all right? Uh, Bisco was one of the, the companies tonight. They had an offer too. You'll see that in your handout. Uh, they give 20% off. So if you want to use that, I'm sure GC and Ketitbach have some offers as well, but Bisco told me theirs, so I put it up here for you and for them. Um, all right, if you want to get a hold of me, you saw how to get a hold of me in that contact information and to get your handout. In your digital handout, these are hyperlinks. If you click on them, they take you to my social media if you want to follow along, okay? Um, so let me answer some questions here. Someone asked if we can clean the veneers with chlorhexidine. Um, I have no idea. And, you know, obviously chlorhexidine that you use for periodontal disease is totally different than the chlorhexidine you could buy, let's say, uh, from Ultradent or the benzoclonium chloride you can buy from Bisco. Uh, those are meant to clean the tooth and kill bacteria. As far as cleaning a veneer with them, um, there may be research out there, but I don't know. So I, I can't answer that one. I'm sorry. Uh, I think a steam cleaner is one of the best ways to go, but it means a little investment. Um, but also an ultrasonic water bath usually works for most people. Um, another question, what to do if a patient has sensitivity after a veneer prep or crown prep and how do you avoid that? Um, I would say sensitivity is one of two things. Well, three things, I guess. Uh, either your temporary doesn't cover all of the exposed tooth or the temporary is thin and they're just getting a little cold sensation coming through a thin temp and it goes away instantly. Uh, or, you know, obviously you could have damaged the nerve. So it really depends on which problem you're having. If you use a temporary cement and things are cemented well, then obviously it would be, you know, a preparation issue or a pulp issue. But I can tell you that um, I rarely see um, sensitivity. And if I do, it's usually like, yeah, it's just a tiny little bit of air sensitivity or a little bit to cold. It only lasts for a second or two. And so that I'm okay with. Uh, it shouldn't be anything significant. Uh, if it is, then something's wrong, obviously, in your protocols. And without sitting chair side and, and watching with like a hands-on program, couldn't say what that is. Uh, but those are the, the main things that, that I think of or would look to when someone's doing a hands-on program. Okay, so that may not answer your question, but since everyone's technique is different, there may be something in a technique that I can't spot or say without seeing someone's work. Um, someone else wrote, can you clean a veneer with Ibuclean? Uh, yeah, certainly can. You know, you're, you're cleaning off phosphates, right? Um, certainly could use something like that. Uh, I would obviously call Ibuclar and get their, you know, feedback as far as how you would implement it. Uh, is it used the same as you would use it on zirconia? Uh, but yeah, you, you could potentially use something like that. Uh, but I, again, I would contact Ivoclar directly, uh, but I would think that would work as well. But that's also scavenging. I don't know if that's going to uh, contact Ivoclar. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the person who just gave me feedback. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. I hope you got a lot out of it. Well, it sounds like you did. So thank you for the, the feedback. Thank you. Uh, Another question, how do you bond multiple veneer cases? If I have six to 11, uh, so I've got six front teeth, do I, do I bond that in the same as I did for the two? Yeah, so basically I showed you two. And so it doesn't matter for me if I've got two, four, six, uh, eight, that same protocol that I showed you. I put the object in, 
I put the mylar strips between the last two teeth, etch everything, bonding agents, all that same stuff. Okay, try and paste, try everything in, adjust things. I then fill every one of them after cleaning them with resin cement, you know, the looting, looting agent, light cured with resin cement, put it on all the teeth, clean off gross excess, leaving a little bit behind. And then I basically start to cure, excuse me, each one of those. So my assistant has a curing light and I have a curing light. And so I may um, just put my fingers on the front of, let's say, back left, closest to my assistant, you know, number 12 and 13. Um, I may have my finger on 12 and 13 and maybe my thumb is on number 11. So I'm holding those. I'm saying, okay, just hit for five seconds on like number 13. And then uh, I'm going to move, take my hand off and I'm going to move my hand over onto 10, 11, 12 and say, okay, another five seconds this time on 12. And so I'm not putting the light on all the teeth. I'm just putting on the ones furthest to the back on the distal. And I'm slowly holding each one, or I shouldn't say each one, each three kind of moving my way around just for five seconds. So I'm getting a light cure through the tooth on, you know, the restoration and the, and the materials. So I am getting an adhesion there. It's not hundred percent, but it's pretty good with the modern curing lights, the LEDs. And so as I work my way around, I make sure everything was seated. Now, if I have a smaller case, like six teeth, uh, I may just push on each one of those to make sure they're seated. And the second I'm done double checking that they're all seated, instantly both of us hit them with a light and I'm just like five seconds on each one. So literally within 15 seconds with two lights, everything's held down pretty well, but I'm then going to go back and hit them for like another 20 to 40 seconds to make sure everything's cured to completion. Uh, so that's pretty much how I approach it. I know some people do like one tooth at a time and I've tried that in the past. It's a nightmare. It takes forever in my mind. I mean, kudos to those that it works for, but if you're doing them one at a time, invariably something's off uh, that you have to make up for. Uh, so I like putting them all in at the same time. Uh, let's see. What do you use to clean the excess after full cure? Oh, good question. So as I said, I break the contacts using the contact easy uh, saw. It's like a little hacksaw. I told you that one. Uh, but then what I do is I actually take um, a small fluted burr, the fisherotomy burrs from SS White. I'll take the SS White burrs and very carefully trying not to touch the ceramic, I'll take off the gross excess going around the tooth. If I touch the ceramic, so long as I'm not pushing hard, it's typically not going to do anything to the ceramic because it's a carbide burr. If you try to clean up resin with a diamond, you will damage the ceramic if you touch it. Carbide burrs, you really have to push on something to actually damage it with the carbide. Um, but I'll also go in with various gold foil knives and or um, hygiene instruments like sickles uh, to clean off the gross excess. Uh, but I would say that most of the time, the majority excess comes off pretty quickly with that SS white burr, the fisherotomy burr. And then the last little cleanup is me using hand instruments. Or if I use that SS white fisherotomy burr, and put my electric hand speed on a low speed of like six or 8,000 uh, revolutions, I can go through and finesse those margins so they're like very smooth. Uh, so that's usually how I'll approach it. Um, on the linguals, if I have excess cement, I oftentimes will, um, will go in there with like a, um, a white stone. You know, if I'm trying to modify, you know, a little bit of the enamel and a little bit of the resin off at the same time, I'll sometimes use a stone. Uh, but for the most part, it's usually a carbide. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, I hit that question earlier. All right, so that one's out. Uh, oh, here's a nice one. Yeah, do I ever put the cement on the prep instead of the veneer and press it on? You, you totally could. I know, I see Dennis all the time doing that. You know, I, I think APA does it that way. Uh, there's, there's a few guys that do it that way. Yeah, you certainly can. I just like loading it into um, the veneer to make sure that I kind of, the way I load it is I have, the resin pretty much coating the entire surface of the veneer and it's sitting, think of like a, a, a plate or a bowl that the resin is covering the whole surface. So when I flip this over and put on the tooth, I know I've got resin everywhere. Uh, I've seen some of the videos where guys just kind of squirt it across the tooth and then push a veneer down. I'm assuming that somebody at some point had to have a bubble or didn't have enough resin that made it out to the margin or something uh, by that technique. But I. You know, you can get a bubble with any technique. Ask me how I know. Uh, but that's that's my personal preference. That's why I do it. So yeah, if, if you're a fan of doing it the other way, go for it. Uh, let's see, what else? 
Uh, thanks again for the feedback. I appreciate it, uh, Juliet. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Farida. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, happy to uh, to give more presentations all the time. I'm I'm all over the place. So if you want to hear more, by all means, I, I'm out there. Um, yeah, thank you for the feedback. That's great. I wish we had more time on this program, but uh, there's so much to cover in so little time. Just means we'll have to do more talking. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tara. I, we did cover a lot, didn't we? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the feedback. Uh, Panna, thank you as well. Sorry, I'm just scrolling down as I'm going through all the questions. There's appreciation and thank yous here. So thank you so much. Uh, oh, here we go. Good question. How can I be sure that my margins are seeded with gross excess cement everywhere? Uh, okay, so this is a perfect question, right? It is hard to tell. And so placing things down, if you have a ton of cement, yeah, wipe some of it off. Okay, you still may not be able to see it, but you should be able to feel that it's down. You could also take an explorer and just run your explorer from the porcelain down onto the tooth structure and you should be able to feel it as well. But ideally, if they lay on there passively and you've pushed it down, you should be able to get it there pretty easily. Um, if for some reason, let's say it's slightly up, you know, it, it can happen, certainly can. And that means you might have a slightly thicker resin margin. Um, my concern is if I, and this is why I do it the way I do. My concern is if I wipe off a hundred percent of the excess cement before I cure it, one of two things is going to potentially happen. Number one, you hit it on the head. You, you can have an air inhibition layer. So you got to put some glycerin down to make sure you don't get that air inhibition layer. Uh, and so that's the first concern. The other thing is as you're wiping off the resin, hard to tell for sure if you've wiped off the right amount or if you took a little bit out from that margin, right? And so you have a slight um, meniscus, you know, a slight concavity that you can't see. And over time, when the patient starts to collect stain and debris there, uh, you'll find it later. So for me personally, I'd rather know that I got a bunch of resin on that margin and that I've trimmed off a bunch of excess that was completely hardened and was not air, inhibi air inhibited. So I know I have solid resin there. So if for some reason I have a slight excess amount of resin on my margin that it wasn't perfectly down, it's just a little extra resin there. I'm not worried about it. Now, if you have so much extra resin that you're off by a millimeter or something, then that's a problem. You better make sure it's seated obviously before you, you cure things. But that is a great question that comes up that you wanna be careful to make sure they are down and make sure when you're pressing that when someone's curing that you're pressing the proper direction and not pressing angularly that the incisal is getting pushed lingually and you're tipping the, the gingival out off the tooth and you have a void or something. So yeah, you wanna be careful. So you bring up a good point. I don't know if either one of them is perfect. They both have their drawbacks, um, but that's the one that works in my hand. Uh, Bruce, thanks for the feedback, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, Kelly, uh, you can get the entire lecture from my handout. Uh, I mentioned you can get that there on dentools.com. Uh, so dentools.com is where you get every slide I showed and a couple extras. Uh, I don't know who anonymous attendee is, but thanks for the feedback. I really appreciate that. I, you'd be amazed how hard I work on trying to make these important and uh, informative to everybody. So thank you, I appreciate your feedback. Uh, Alicia, thank you so much. Appreciate you as well. Uh, yeah, all the time out there lecturing on different things. So feel free to, to listen to more as well as my private programs um, at, uh, at legion.dentist. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, here's a good question. We didn't hit on this yet. If you wanna apply a desensitizing agent, uh, if you wanna apply a desensitizing, desensitizing agent, when would you do it? Before or after etching? Uh, I'm gonna apply it after etching if I were to use one. Now I would say, I'd apply it afterwards because you're probably defeating the purpose if you put it on beforehand and then etch the tooth, or you're gonna take away at least some of its efficacy. Um, no problem if you're using one, you know, if you wanna use like a glutaraldehyde um, uh, based system, like a G5 from Clinician's Choice, or you wanna use Gluma from, uh, was it Harris Colser? If you wanna use one of those types of products, yeah, you know, you, you certainly could. But what I would tell you, um, and this goes for the same if you're placing direct restorations, indirect restorations of any kind, is that usually a desensitizing agent, if you're using the bonding agent correctly, you don't need one. Uh, I personally have tried them before just to have used them, 
But I can tell you, if you apply your bonding agent well enough that you seal all the tubules, you don't have sensitivity. And it's not just me saying that, you know, there's a lot of people that say that. I would say where people tend to use desensitizers, usually if I sit there and watch their technique, their technique is flawed or too hurried or they're missing steps. Uh, and, and so that really is just a one-on-one -on -one helping someone chair side or on a lab bench to show them where they're making mistakes they don't realize they're making. Um, so recognize one, that there's, a, there's a, a problem in the technique that creates the sensitivity typically. Not every time, but typically. Uh, but does that mean you can't use desensitizers or something's wrong with it? No, it certainly will help you out to make it not sensitive. So if you wanna use one, go right ahead, but I would use it after etching. And again, just make sure you're following all the protocols. All right, so that's a good one. Uh, Iman, thank you, appreciate it. Oh, good one. I, I hit on this, uh, this is a good question. I did hit on it earlier, but let me hit on it again. Uh, if I'm going to put in um, an Emacs crown, is etching and bonding necessary or can I just cement them? Anytime I'm doing a crown and the crown has good retention and I have good thickness of ceramic for strength, I will cement that almost every time. I, me personally is, I like cements for the benefits they give that resins cannot. And the benefits again, being like a resin modified glass honor, calcium phosphate, fluoride ions to strengthen tooth structure, everything will leak at some point typically. And so when it does, I want something that, that helps the patient. Uh, resin doesn't, you know, resin breaks down with time, absorbs bacteria and moisture and causes problems. You know, that's all proven. And so me, I'm gonna try and cement every time I can. And that's again, either glass on system or like calcium illuminate with the doxa ceramir. Those are my go-tos. Um, but obviously if there's no retention and or veneers, you know, you have to use resins. And so there's great products like Bisco, but Ava Clark, Kerr, many, you know, there's lots of great products out there. My personal face, favorite because of what I already mentioned earlier was the Bisco Choice 2 and the Albon Universal. Uh, that's what's given me all the great success over all these years. Uh, let's see, someone came in late, not sure if I covered this area would you bond the teeth all at once or one by one? I did cover that, but nonetheless, um, I typically do them all at the same time. Well, I, they're all put in at the same time, but the light obviously hits them individually as we're going across. I use two lights at the same time. I don't like personally placing them one by one. I find that you run into more problems with seating and adjusting and trying to get things to fit when you go one by one. Um, I, just not a fan of it, but you know, I know there's people out there that do it. And if it works for them or you, uh, keep doing so. Uh, let's see, Valerie, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, great. Oh, great. I'll look forward to you being at my program then as well. Thank you. Uh, where's that one? Uh, is VarioLink a good bonding material for veneers? Oh yeah, of course. You know, Avicar makes great products. Um, yeah, you know, like... <laughs> Just because I use a product doesn't mean you'll get the same success I do. Let me point that out. Uh, just because a bottle is a good product doesn't mean you get the same results. You have to make the bottle work. And that's when we do bonding tests with, with students and or dentists, everyone gets different strength properties, even though it's the same bottle. It's because of technique. So most of the stuff out there nowadays is pretty good stuff. I think some are more forgiving that have more latitude that people can get better results. Um, but you're not gonna go wrong with an Ivoclar product typically, you know, maybe one or two over the years has been less desirable. No, they've got great products too. So if you're using that and getting great results, keep using it. Uh, but if you find out that it's not something or you wanna try something different, uh, you might be surprised that Bisco Choice 2 in my hands is phenomenal. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not going back through the half veneers at this point. Uh, hopefully I hit on it enough earlier, but um, not many people do them. But if you wanna ask me more, uh, hit me up in the comment section. We can have a, a, a discussion over email or something. So I will hit on it, just not right here since we already went through it. Uh... Oh, someone, uh, Heather, thanks for helping us out. Kettenbach distributor for Toronto is Serum Dental Supplies. I don't know if whoever was asking that question is still around, but there you go. Uh, Monobond Plus, that is um, basically a a silane type of product. 
And yes, you can use that for veneers. I would contact Ivaclar to get more information, but yeah, you can use that. Um, the same as like Karari has their ceramic primer, GC has a ceramic primer, uh, Bisco has a ceramic primer. Ceramic primers are similar to silanes as far as what they do, as far as chemically connecting um, ceramic to resin adhesives. Uh, so yeah, it's it's kind of like um, kind of like a silane, you could say. Uh, let's see. <laughs> There's more questions on the half veneers. Uh, sorry to confuse you all uh, or, or bring up something, but they are unique. How many veneers do I recommend? Uh, it depends on the case, right? Depends on your skill and your lab skill and what the patient wants. Again, what does the patient want? And then the question is, can you deliver? Uh, if you can't, then tell them why you can't. You know, don't, don't make up stories or reasons. Uh, just tell them the truth. I can't do it for this reason. Um, it depends on the patient. You know, I can do one veneer. My lab technician is that good. I can do two, four, six, eight. Uh, depends on if we're trying to widen the arch, change colors, whatever it's trying to achieve, we can do it. Uh, it's not a problem. Uh, it just depends on the skill set of your ceramist and your ability to communicate and, uh, with the patient and with the technician. Uh, if I'm doing a full arch, what order do you cement? Um, if I'm doing a full arch, it depends. You know, if I've got crowns, I always put the crowns in first because I can cement them quickly and easily. And that segregates out the veneers so I can put the veneers in individual, or I shouldn't say individually, as in groupings. So if I put crown, let's say I've got a crown on six and 11. Well, now I only have to put veneers, let's say on seven to 10. So I've isolated, made it simpler to just do four teeth to veneer as compared to, let's say, doing like six or 10 teeth. So for the same token, if I'm doing, let's say, 10 veneers, I may glue the premolars on first. So I'll do one side, I'll put two veneers on. Then I'll go to the other side and put two veneers on. And I'll have a mylar strip between the, um, the canine and the premolar so I can't damage or get any adhesive on the canine that I'd have to try and get off somehow without damaging my margin. So I've segmented it to make it easier on me. And then once I have the premolars on, then, and I won't clean off the excess unless there's a little bit interproximally that's gonna hinder my veneer from seeding, but I don't clean off the excess because I don't wanna potentially have bleeding or issues. So um, if I've done the premolars, now I can just drop six veneers on the front six and be done. So I will segment at times based on how large a case is but I'll typically put the crowns in first uh, just to make that part simplified. And then I have the basis to break things down uh, into segments. Uh, let's see. I think I got most of the questions. I'm still, there's 22 open, but I didn't close them all out. So I'm just scrolling through real quick to see if I missed anything. Uh, do I often use Z prime for zirconia crown cementation? I always use Z prime from Bisco for my zirconia crown cementation when I'm using resin adhesives. Yes. Phenomenal product does a great job. I will say if you ever have to cut off a zirconia crown when you've used that and done things well, it's a nightmare. It's a super tooth. Uh, it's, it takes a while. Uh, yeah, not fun, but it's phenomenal what that material can do. Uh, Tim, thanks so much for the feedback. If you're still on here. Uh, another question, how long do veneers usually last? Uh, it depends on one's technique. It depends on hygiene and diet of the patient. It depends, depends on their function. You know, there's a lot of variables. So I couldn't say there's a specific time frame. I would hope a veneer would last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, knock on wood, majority of mine, 10, 15, 20 years, they're all still there. Um, my dad, who's 22 years old, he just had one come off last year during COVID. And he just broke another one the other day. Uh, so 22 years for him, basically. So yeah, they last well you know, when done right, right? Like anything. Uh, and if the patient takes care of things. Dad's grinding his teeth these days. So uh, go wear a guard. <laughs> All right, we're almost done here. Uh, is longevity affected by prep design? Yes, it is. I kind of mentioned that. If you look at research, longevity studies, they show preparation designs in enamel, better longevity than in dentin. And granted, there's a lot of variables there based on, again, technique and adhesive capabilities and, you know, just infinite variables. But they show as a whole that if you stay on enamel, you get better longevity. And that we also know that adhesives on enamel last longer. Adhesives on dentin don't last as long just due to endogenous proteases inside the tooth. Uh, so stay on the enamel, you get the best benefits for longevity. And should something have to be replaced, you got more tooth structure. Uh... 
How long am I waiting, if at all, to take final impressions if you've altered the gingival position with a laser? Uh, me personally, if I alter the tissues with a laser, I'm taking impression the same day, but that depends on one's technique, obviously, depends on the biotype, depends on how fragile the tissues are, how much energy you put into the tissues. There's a lot of variables there. Uh, if you're careful, man, a laser is very precise and can do virtually no damage, right? Other than just vaporizing a little bit of tissue. So it's, it'll stay right where you put it if you have a great technique. Uh, so yeah, I'll always take my impression the same day. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. How do you mask tetracycline stained teeth? Uh, me personally, I just prep more tooth structure and make sure the lab knows by seeing a photograph that they put an opacous layer down of ceramic and then they, um, they use more translucent stuff on top of the ceramic. So it, you have more reduction uh, for me. But I know some, some dentists will go in there and put a pink resin down, like a pink flowable down to uh, mask the tetracycline stain. I find that I'm not a huge fan of that for me personally, that the two times I tried it, uh, I'd rather just prep a little more off and build it all into ceramic. Do I discuss feedback before the wax up and mock up or do I charge a fee for the wax up mock up? I always charge a fee for my wax ups and I sometimes charge a fee for my mock ups. Uh, but yeah, I want to get feedback on the wax up before they come in. So like uh, the patient always comes in before our appointment to look at the wax up to make any changes and modifications. I don't do it the same day I'm prepping them. Uh, the mock up I will sometimes do before the day of preparation if the patient's a little more challenging. Uh, if they like the wax up and they're not real challenging, I'll put the mock up on not so much for them to see it, uh, but more for me to be able to reduce the least amount of tooth structure. But nonetheless, they get to see it and get wowed. Um, and just get excitement for the day. Uh, but I, uh, I do charge for the wax up always, uh, but I will uh, get the lab oftentimes to help me with the wax up as far as giving me the fee of the wax up back that I paid for if the patient moves forward. So if I do a bunch of wax ups on patients trying to get people to move forward, uh, I pay for all those. But if the patient does move forward, the lab credits me back the wax up. So it's kind of a, a advertising marketing for both of us. So we both have skin in the game, so to speak. Uh, who is my ceramist? Uh, I've got a couple of different ones. I've got uh, one out here in Irvine at Ultimate Styles, and I got another one at uh, VTech uh, here in uh, Lake Forest in Southern California. Uh, Ultimate Styles is pretty world famous with uh, Hiro Akitada and um, Naoki, uh, pretty phenomenal ceramists. Uh, Hiro uses uh, GC for a lot of his stuff, and that's why I was mentioning it earlier. earlier. Sealing, how do I seal the dentin? Uh, obviously that's your bonding agent, just a really good technique with your bonding agent being very thorough. Uh, that's all goes, boils down to technique following instructions. Uh, oh, here's a good question. I, I'll just answer a couple more here um, and then I'll, I'll cut it off. Uh, if I have a single veneer, how would I temporize it? I would, uh, if I, depending on the veneer, if it wraps around the tooth and the tooth had a decent shape to begin with, I probably wouldn't waste my time to do the bead line technique. I'd probably just take an over impression of their tooth and, uh, and just duplicate the same shape they came in with. Uh, if their tooth is too far damaged, I may just do it an old fashioned 1980s, 1990s spot etch in the center of the tooth, a tiny dab of bonding agent right in the center of that little, little dab of etchant, you know, so a small circular, like smaller than a pea size, little area of adhesion, and then just freehand some composite, you know, like take whatever your favorite composite is and just quickly freehand a temporary you know, four minutes or less, you're done. Uh, so that's usually what I, I would do if I don't have good um, interproximal or someplace for mechanical retention. Like if it's just a mineral prep on one tooth, that might be what I do. Uh, but I kind of have to see a tooth to know. But that's two things I, or three things I said I could go to based on what it is. Uh, da, 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 da. Isabella, thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate your feedback. Uh, my choice of cementation adhesion materials and does the cho choice change with preparation style? Uh, honestly, whether I'm doing a deep prep or minimal prep, I'm using the choice to light cured resin for all of my veneers. Makes no difference. If I jump to a crown, then I'll use cements most of the time unless I don't have good retention. 
Uh, let's see, someone else asked a question. Any comments on Snap-on provisionals? I've never really been a fan of them. Um, they, they just seem a little bulky. And um, since they uh, snap to place, they don't fit as snug because you got to reline them and things. I just, I, I feel it's faster and easier just to use beautiful uh, temporary materials like um, the Vesalis from Kettenbach and Lux Attempt from DMG. Like uh, I find it's just faster and easier and less expensive. And let's face it, at the end of the day, fast, easy and less expensive is what I go for um, when it works well, obviously. I don't cut corners, but that's what I use. Uh, da, 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 da. Someone else said um, Synergy Dental Partners is also great for Kettenbach discounts. There you go. So if anyone's still on here, uh, da, 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 da. I already hit on that. Can I cantilever the half? Everyone's on the half veneers. <laughs> uh, can I cantilever the half veneer off of the lateral incisor? Um, depending on how far you're trying to extend things out, I wouldn't make a tooth, obviously. But if you want to make a, let's say, a peg lateral look a little bit broader, yeah, you know, there's people that do those kind of things too. Uh, some people call them ice chips. Um, so yeah, yeah, you can do that. Uh, someone else said they found veneers develop marginal staining over time. Yeah, sometimes they do. Uh, whether it's just um, some type of leakage on the day of cementation or contaminant, whether it's air inhibition layer, whether it was resin being pulled out. Yeah, you can sometimes see that. Um, for me, it's making sure the tissue is back far enough away from the margin whether that's placing a cord, using a laser, or just your preparation positioning, making sure things are isolated well, you know, dry, free of circular fluids and bleeding. Um, but every once in a while, I'll see a little bit of stain there. And so I'll go back in usually with the uh, air abrasion unit and just lightly abrade it off to get the stain off. And then I'll go back and etch and apply a bonding agent, sometimes a little flowable just to kind of seal it up. Uh, if you find it earlier, it's better. You find it later, it's a lot more challenging, but that does happen. Uh, let's see, I think I hit on hemostatics already. Okay, so I think I got everything there. Is there anyone still listening? <laughs> 120, 109, okay. Unless anyone's got more questions, I think I hit on just about everything on, uh, I'm gonna go home and get some dinner and call it a day. So thank you everyone for, um, for being here. Those that stuck around, I hope I got your questions. I know it's not everything. There's a lot more to cover. Uh, do I use an electrosurge? No, I use lasers. Uh, you can use electrosurge. If I did use one, I'd use a very small point uh, or a very thin loop. Uh, Thomas, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, so if, um, if you uh, want more information, again, uh, my program's on legion.dentist or I usually have a schedule up on my webpage uh, showing where I'm lecturing, where I'm giving webinars and podcasts, but you're always welcome to uh, contact me directly too and ask what I'm doing and where I'm going. Uh, so I've been teaching for over 30, or almost 30 years now uh, at UCLA and all around the world and whatnot. I've loved doing it, love helping. That's why I'm still here. I, I just enjoy doing it. It doesn't, doesn't matter if someone's paying me. I just enjoy helping. It's, it's what makes me feel good. I like helping. Uh, there's been enough trial and error in my world after almost 30 years of doing this that I, I got a lot of information to share. So um, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks for all the comments coming in. Appreciate you. Uh, hope you have a great year. And I look forward to talking to you more. Feel free to uh, reach out to me on my email or again on Dentools. You can reach out to me there as well. All the best. Thanks.